it is possible that we will be having Peter Chetik here. Nice. But um, not definite. How's Peter doing these days? I haven't He's talked to him fine. in a he long was, time. He was just at the Adirondack Astronomy Retreat a ah, weeks ago. Ah. And he was doing very well there. And he seemed, he and Diane seem to be doing great. Good. So we're hoping to get him and possibly as a regular participant. Excellent. For tonight or for tonight, a while? Hopefully. There he yeah, is, right? right. Boy, you mention his name and he shows yeah, up. Yeah, he shows up like Look a genie. David is second in power only to God, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Hello, Peter. Hello, everyone. Give me a few minutes to get things settled here. I'm listening. And we're listening to we you. We can talk about you while we're waiting. <laughs> yes, you sure can. It's been a while, David, since you've seen your husband. It's been quite a while. Yeah. Yeah. We had some good times long ago at various places, didn't we? Yeah. We Hi, might. Peter. Hey, Peter, how are you? I'm pretty darn good. How are you guys? Still hey, getting the lighting there. set up here. Hang on. That was when we were even sillier than we are now, I think, in our oh, year. Yeah. Is that even possible? Well, you know, it's <laughs> close measurement, possible. probably, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we did we lose David? Uh oh, he'll be back. Maybe. I don't doubt that. Where are you right now, Dave Iker? I am in the Astronomer's Paradise <clears throat> near Milwaukee, Wisconsin. That is if you're an astronomer who never needs to observe. Never. <laughs> <laughs> you just do I radio really, astronomy, right? You don't need even I, clear sky. I, I, I do a lot of observing when I travel. You know, I'm not kidding. This is not a joke. You know, the old saying at the office is Milwaukee is a wonderful place to live as an astronomer if you can travel enough. That's right. You know, yep. I do have a question for you, uh, David Eicher. Yes, sir. Uh, how did how did scientists arrive at the idea? I know it's an incorrect idea, but how did they arrive at the idea that space had this ether in it? Oh boy, or that yeah. it was made of an ether. That goes way back to the earth, to the Greek times, actually, because the earliest models of, of the cosmos, which had this multitude of concentric spheres within uh -huh. each other, included an ether to explain things like the atmosphere and otherwise unexplainable things like meteors and so on and things like that. So that goes back um, all the way to Greek times the sort of vague philosophical hangover of an ether existing and explaining various atmospheric phenomena which they didn't understand correctly. I see. And then it lived on a long, long time, even, you know, as a relatively logical idea before some of the crackpot mm. ideas came up on top of it, like, you know, um, Earth is, you know, hollow and that kind of fun stuff that persisted all the way up into the 19th century some of this lunacy you know before it died out even today <laughs> even today oh, there, wait a minute there aren't any crazy people today are there all you have to do is watch msnbc There's plenty for, of lunacy for, when you get to all those moon observer guys for three yeah, seconds so. yeah yeah we still haven't gotten rid of the crazies but we're working on it What a world we have. Yes. Get rid of all the crazies. Or at least keep them out of running things, you know, would be an <laughs> Out of running things. I know we don't want to get political here, but geez. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I was in this last 
historical trip I took. It's a good thing, Scott, you don't want me to talk about history because on my just on my last trip I took, you know, yeah. 30, 400 images. But I was in the room. You know what? One of the most important rooms you probably don't know about is James Madison's study at Montpelier, which is near Orange, Virginia. You know, you know, Madison and Monroe also to a lesser degree were sort of adherents to Jefferson. So they moved and built houses near relatively near Monticello. But this is the room in which it's a small, ordinary study about the size of this room with a couple of chairs and bookcases oh. and so on and a table, a work table. Yeah. And that's the room in which Madison supplied by books, mostly in English, but some in French and other languages, sent back by Jefferson, who was in Paris at the time, studied all the law books he could and created the core of what became the U.S. Constitution and the Bill of Rights. Wow. This room, you know, and what they would think of what's happening recently here with respect yeah. to what they designed. Holy mackerel. Yeah, I, I wonder think what they, they would, would all think of join all that. Our, our global star party to talk about it. I think every one of them would. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and Shakespeare would be with them. I think. Yes. So, yeah. so David, what do you think is the most important historical moment in all of astronomy? Oh, I don't know. I have a feeling it would be uh, perhaps when Galileo looked through his little spyglass and saw Jupiter and those three little stars next to it. Mm -hmm. It might have been when Gersonides invented the um, Jacob staff, which is a okay. 14th century answer to the Webb telescope. Yeah. Uh, I think it might be when uh, a young shepherd boy named David looked up at the night sky and wrote a poem. I think that it was- Could be, yeah. Could be. So I've given you a few choices there. Yeah. Your first statement is exactly what came to my mind, David. The in the autumn, in the October uh, sixteen nine, when Galileo, who lived near the church in which he's entombed now, um, moved his newly invented telescope, which he was horrified hearing about telescopes, simple telescopes being for sale on the street in Paris. And of course, what does an academic need all the time? Just then, as now more money you know so he was thinking of inventing this himself someday rushed home and made his own first telescope in a weekend and moved from looking at the steeple of this church in padua over to see the moon that was his first astronomical observation yeah i, I would go with galileo on that and oh, and, the, so. and, well, and then and then within the next six months he had discovered that the Milky Way was composed of innumerable stars, the Galilean satellites, the crescent phases of Venus. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to interrupt for a second. Peter, I'm going to ask you to talk about the genesis of the stars go nova because you know the fellow that came up with the first line. And then you and I are going to do it together, if that's okay. Oh, wow. Yeah. <clears throat> This is okay with that, Peter? We've been working on this for a couple of weeks now. We've done everything except practice it. So I have okay. no idea. <laughs> this will be this will be an historic night here. Yeah. This is very, very famous, Scott. Have you heard this before? You must have. No. Oh, you're in for so. a treat. No think so. Maybe. We're gonna see. I'll know it when I hear it. <laughs> All right, we are going to do We're going to go ahead and get started here, guys. So here we go. For the first time ever, scientists using NASA's Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope have found the source of a high-energy neutrino from outside our galaxy. The neutrino came from the eruption of a supermassive black hole at the center of a type of galaxy called a blazar. The eruption jetted out particles moving near the speed of light. Collisions inside the jet produced gamma rays, the highest energy form of light, and neutrinos, ghostly particles that rarely interact with matter. 3.7 billion years later, they reached Earth. On September 22, 2017, 
a single high-energy neutrino struck an atom in a water molecule in the Antarctic ice. The crash produced a particle called a muon. It raced through the ice so fast it emitted a faint blue glow. When the muon reached the South Pole, it was tracked by the IceCube Neutrino Observatory. IceCube scientists found the original neutrino likely came from beyond our solar system. They alerted astronomers to be on the lookout for cosmic outbursts possibly associated with it. NASA's Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope found the source, a blazar it had been watching for some time. When the neutrino arrived, Fermi saw the blazar was brighter than it had been over the previous decade. It's the first time a neutrino could be traced back to a black hole, or to any source beyond our immediate galactic neighborhood. And it's an important step forward for a growing field scientists call multi-messenger astronomy, which combines light with new signals like gravitational waves and neutrinos to provide new insights on the most extreme cosmic phenomena. This is Scott Roberts from Explore Scientific and the Explore Alliance, and you are watching the 102nd uh, Global Star Party, the Mind Cosmos Connection. Uh, tonight we have some very special guests, some people who have never been on before, including uh, Ron and Teresa from uh, the Badlands Observatory. Uh, joining us uh, after a long hiatus is Jerry Hubble, and I think Wes McDonald will be joining him as well. But first, we're going to get started with David Levy and his pal, Peter Jadicki, uh, for a very special start to the Global Star Party. David, you wanna come on? Well, thank you. Thank you, Scott, and hello, everybody. In addition to all the friends that I have with me, hi, Adrian and David, uh, we have one who has been a good friend of mine for many decades, but uh, has never been on this Global Star Party. And I was going to tell him that this is the first global star party we've done. But uh, that's not really true. Uh, this is actually the 102nd. And it all started when they, uh, Scotty called me and asked me if I wouldn't mind appearing on these. It was over a year ago and uh, a couple of years ago now and uh, doing a little poetic quote. And I've done that for all but one of the global star parties. And today we're going to do something a little different. I'd like to introduce you to Peter Jedeke, uh, who is right there and who's going to tell us we're going to do a song for you together. And the song is called The Stars Go Nova. Peter, tell me a bit about, before we do this, tell me a bit about the genesis of The Stars Go Nova. Um, sure. If you'd like me to talk for two hours, I can do that without preparing anything. <laughs> but if you want me to talk for only five minutes, I will need a week to prepare something. Well, let's compromise about a couple of minutes. For sure. I think we can do that. So um, I think the thing with songs started for me at the 1976 REC General Assembly when the Ottawa Centre members had um, some songs that they sang on a bus tour. And I thought, what a great idea, put astronomy words to popular melodies, since I can't write melodies, but I sure as heck can throw together some rhyming astronomy things. 
So I started working on astronomy songs and we sang them at general assemblies and stellophane and all kinds of other things like that. So that was the basic idea behind them. And um, I, I love the idea of singing in the middle of the dark, you know, a dark star party because nobody can tell who you are and you can just sing away and no one knows who you are because it's dark out. That worked out fine for quite a while. Okay, so now this one in particular, we're sitting around having dinner at a restaurant one night and a young man named David Bigelow, who was a member of our RESC London Center in those days, we were talking about songs that we could do and David Bigelow just up out of nothing, he just said, the stars go nova one by one, kaboom. And I thought, there's a song right there. So, in fact, David Bigelow, I've always given him credit whenever I uh, report on this song, whenever anybody asks me about it, uh, ask me for the lyrics or whatever. And a couple of years ago, I did look him up. He's now a teacher at a college in Nanaimo, British Columbia. And when I told him he was famous in the astronomy world for being the uh, co-creator of this song, he was pretty amazed because, of course, he hadn't heard any of that all his career as a math teacher there at this college. Anyway, so he was thrilled. So there we go, David, that's the background. And of course, I do like to try and put a little bit of current research in things. So I did add a fourth verse after the original three verses came out back around 1980. And um, there was actually a, an online version of this, a group, I think they're in Kansas of all places, a group called the Big Bang Band. Oh, well, I remember them. You know, you've heard of them? Sure. And it predates the TV show. It predates the Big Bang Theory TV show. So By it's okay. A long Everybody time. Can use it. Yeah. So they reached out to me and said they wanted to do this as part of their shows. Of course, I said fine. And they are available on YouTube that doing this song, which is kind of cute because they kind of do it like a minstrel thing with uh, pipes and little dancey things. Well, I'll do the first three verses with you, and I'll let you handle the fourth one yourself. Are you okay? Sure. Okay. The stars go over one by one. Kaboom. 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 Nucleosynthesis is done. Kaboom. Kaboom. The supernova dissipate what fusion energy helped create, and the stars go nova. In the galaxy, the heavy elements are born. Kaboom! Kaboom! And from the stellar cores are torn. Kaboom! Kaboom! Shells and gases distributing matter all over the place. And the spiral arms are littered with debris. Do galaxies in space collide? Kaboom! Kaboom! It seems they must, because they're so wide. Kaboom, kaboom. Computer simulations show 500 million years or so is what it takes for galaxies to merge. As years go by, the remnants spread. Kaboom, kaboom. But the universe is far from dead. Kaboom, kaboom. To eliminate the tedium in the interstellar medium, come the molecules that make up you and me and on that note back to you scotty Thank wow you. <laughs> that was awesome <laughs> i loved it i loved it that's maybe great. next week we'll have another one well that's great so um look you're not going to hear this song on any other channel except for <laughs> the ones you're listening to it right now okay <laughs> So, but uh, that was that was wonderful. And Peter and David, thank you so much for sharing that uh, that great tune. So, thank you. Yeah. Um, look on uh, on every Global Star Party, we have the Astronomical League join us. Uh, uh, you will see different members of the executive staff uh, that uh, come on to ask questions and ask questions for the upcoming door prizes and answer questions for the winners of the uh, last round of door prizes. And, um, uh, you know, it's, it's wonderful to have these guys on. The Astronomical League is largely run by volunteers, uh, as it has been done so, I guess, for 75 years. And um, 
Uh, they every year have an event called the Astronomical League Convention. Uh, there was some pause that happened uh, during COVID, but uh, nevertheless, they still decided to keep it going virtually. And then this last one we were at uh, was a hybrid event where, you know, I got to go in with them and we ran part of it streaming, part of it in person. Uh, so it was pretty cool uh, to see all of that go down. And they had an incredible lineup of speakers, like uh, the likes of which you can't imagine. So, um, so I'm looking forward to the next one, which will be down in um, in the uh, uh, in near. It's not New Orleans, I don't think. Baton uh, Rouge. Baton Rouge. Okay. Baton Rouge. So there you go, Louisiana. Mm -hmm. So anyhow, I'm going to turn this over to Don Nab. Don, Don, thank you for coming on to the 102nd Global Star Party. Sure. Glad to be here, and I'll start my slides in a moment, but first I want to show, you know, the first slide will be about solar observing, the Astronomical League, and all amateur astronomers and professional astronomers take safety very seriously. So there was this article, I think I may have showed this last time along, was in the current reflector, which all Astronomical League members get. So mm -hmm. we really take that up seriously. So let me uh, let me start my, my slides. I will... Uh, find it here and share my screen, which would be this one. And I will start my slideshow. Coming through okay? It is at that, yes. Okay, so <clears throat> again, we always start with the warning that the sun has to be properly filtered. You, you can't, can't shortcut this. <clears throat> you can't use welder's glass or a filter on an eyepiece. It'll melt right through many times. Uh, you can't leave it unattended. You have to use the right kind of filter on the objective lens and uh, uh, or wear eclipse glasses to view it just naked eye. So if, you don't, if you're not sure, don't do it. Ask for help, okay? <clears throat> you can go blind immediately. All right, so here is from August 11th, the questions that were asked. And there, as you can see up here in the middle, this is the new uh, emblem for the... Uh, the Baton Rouge Alcon 2023 that is put up there. So Perseverance recently spotted Mars moon Phobos eclipsing the sun. Watching such events helps scientists do what? And the answer was watching this event helps them understand how the moon will spiral into Mars in the distant future. And there's the image of, uh, of Phobos eclipsing the sun. What is this? It's been all over the news. This is uh, the black hole at the center of our galaxy, Sagittarius A. And what's another name for VV, or is that W? No, it's VV689. And the answer is Angel Wing. So these are the uh, the winners Cameron Gillis, uh, Shaw Corey, and Dave New. Normally, my name's up there too, but uh, my wife and I were camping last week. We were off the grid with almost no internet service, so I couldn't even watch the show, but uh, I'll probably get on next week. So questions for this week, and I'll take my time here because we always hear that we go too fast. So uh, number one, what are the only two planets in our solar system without moons? Is that Venus and Mars? or Jupiter and Saturn, or Mercury and Venus. And always, we want you to send your answers within the next day or two to secretary at astroleague.org. Send them to, uh, to Terry Mann. So the only two planets without moons, Venus and Mars, Jupiter and Saturn, or Mercury and Venus. One of my favorite clusters in the, uh, the summer night sky, who named Messier 11 the wild duck cluster. So this is up in the uh, upper left of Sagittarius. Um, and it's a it's a very small open cluster. It almost looks like a globular, but it's not. It's an open cluster. Uh, was it Admiral Smith, Charles Messier, or Edwin Hubble? Again, who named the wild duck cluster? I don't see the wild ducks in there, but somebody did. One of these three did. I'm not sure how. Admiral Smith, Charles Messier, or Edwin Hubble. And thirdly, 
uh, when three celestial bodies align, what's the term used for the condition when three celestial bodies are arranged in a straight line? And here's an example, a solar eclipse, sun, moon, and earth. So what do we call it? Is that a triplex, an apparition, or is that syzygy? Which of those three, triplex, apparition, or syzygy? So uh, again, send answers to secretary at astroleague.org. Uh, as soon as you can, the day a day or two, and uh, then we'll see who came up with the right answers next week. And lastly, is this uh, announcement about the uh, September sixteenth? I think it's a Friday. Usually they are. I have to check. Uh, the next Astronomical League live. Brent Maynard doing preparing for a night of image capture, <clears throat> and the usual a lot of the contributors: Carol Orb, Terry Mann. John Goss, Scott Roberts, and David Levy will be there. So uh, they're always wonderful. So back to you, Scott. Okay, thank you very much, Don. That's great. Um, okay, I think, let me, uh, let me remove the spotlight here. There we go. Um, our next uh, speakers here, well, our next speaker will be David Eicher from Astronomy Magazine. David has been uh, uh, taking us through uh, the universe. He's taken it acro us across uh, our own planet with uh, crystals and minerals. And um, uh, we didn't have a lot of time to talk about his program today. But uh, David, what, what, uh, what, what do you have in store for us? And you are muted. Sorry about that. Can you hear me That's now? That's okay. Hear you now. Yes. Okay. Yes, okay. I looked. I took a look at the schedule and what we've been talking about, and it suddenly dawned on me that for at least two years, I think we haven't talked about meteorites. So this week and next, I was going to talk in two parts again about Great. meteorites and and show some images there. Wonderful. So I'll take it away. Take it away. And thank you, Scott. And I will share my screen and I will see if I can start a show and you should be seeing oh, wow. something yes. here. Beautiful palace. And let me see if I can start the slideshow. And can you see that? Okay. Yes. That's okay. an incredible specimen. Look at that. Well, everyone loves meteorites in the astronomy field, and this is where we've been talking for a long time about all sorts of classes of minerals on Earth, which is how the universe builds planets, planetary geology. But here's where geology and astronomy merge with meteorites, and, and we can hold pieces of the solar system uh, that are not from Earth in our hands. Uh, and look at them and talk about them and talk about chemistry and, and all that sort of thing. And meteorites are mostly, of course, pieces of asteroids, but some of them come from other uh, somewhat more exotic places as well. This is an interesting palisite here, which I'll get to later. But tonight I was going to talk about the relatively plentiful and often ordinary ones, which are the stony meteorites. Next week, I'll talk about this, the somewhat more complex ones. So how did we get going with this whole concept of stones falling out of the sky and hopefully not hitting us in the head? Well, in 1492, a stone fell from the sky in what is now Enzesheim, France. And this was one of the most famous early meteorite falls. But the problem is that no one believed that rocks could be falling from the heavens. And we talked earlier about these concentric circles and the idea of what was up there above Earth's atmosphere that lingered on for many centuries from Greek ideas of, of not understanding the distant scale and the enormous uh, size of even the solar system. So the idea that rocks could be falling out of the sky onto Earth's surface seemed crazy for a long, long time. Well, that famous early uh, fall led to an, another major one that was really hard to to ignore because it was witnessed by many, many people. And that happened also in what is now France, in Normandy, uh, at a place called Le Aigle, uh, which is the French word for eagle. Uh, mm. That happened in 1803, and it converted many skeptics because uh, 3,000 stones fell into the region there, and that was a little bit harder to 
uh, justify in, in another uh, non-magical way. So, and then just a few years okay. later in the United States, in 1807, uh, there was a, a, a fall that convinced a lot of people that this had to be really occurring, and especially the American scientists at the time. There were three very loud booms and then a shower of stones cascaded down, centered over what's now Weston, Connecticut, and, and that changed many people's minds that this phenomenon had to be real and it, it wasn't a hoax or something strange going on. Um, and this was uh, studied very meticulously by a chemist uh, and a professor of natural philosophy, as they were called at the time, at Yale University, Benjamin Silliman, who became a very famous early American scientist. Uh, and there's a mineral, jumping back to minerals, called silimanite that's named after him uh, now. And, and he analyzed them carefully. And then the sort of traction that meteorites were real and there could be stones falling out of the sky uh, was generally pretty accepted. Now we know of more than 40,000 falls or finds of meteorites, and they're broadly classified in three types, stony, stony iron, and iron. Uh, and there are many, many complexities within those categories, of course, of classification. We won't get into all that stuff tonight or next week, uh, but but uh, we'll look at some examples of them and talk about some of the interesting kinds. And it's really a neat thing because you can hold pieces of the distant solar system and even some uh, atoms and compounds that are older than Earth that we're on here in your wow. hand with some of these. So it's pretty cool. Meteorites, of course, for the most part are pieces of asteroids and the most exotic of them uh, are lunar. There, there are more than 370 uh, lunar meteorites known now. Uh, and that's the best way to have a moon rock in your own collection is to get a lunar meteorite unless you're willing to break into the Johnson Space Center, which I don't recommend. Um, and there are 175 falls now that are known to be Martian meteorites. And of course, the lunar and Martian exotic types uh, are, we'll get into this next week in more detail, but but they're known, their origin is known because of the analysis of the flavors, if you will, um, the, the isotopes of oxygen and other elements that are locked up within these crystals and comparing them to the Apollo samples that were returned, or in the case of Mars, to the uh, in situ analysis of Martian rocks by the Vikings. Um, and later spacecraft. So just very, very broadly, the kinds of meteorites, you could do hours on meteorite classification, but to keep it very simple here, the broad classes are stony meteorites, which represent the mantles of asteroids, the outer part of parts of asteroids. And they're in two big general classes, chondrites, which have so-called chondrules in them, which are little grains that you can see of melted and solidified droplets from the early days of the solar system. Uh, overall, they're not modified as a whole uh, by global melting or differentiation. Achondrites, however, the other big class, do not have chondrules. Uh, that's the name, and they are differentiated and reprocessed, similar to terrestrial basalts or plutonic rocks, and they're a little bit rarer types. Then there's stony iron meteorites, like the palisite we looked at uh, um, the, on the first slide there, uh, and they represent uh, the boundary material between the mantle and the cores of asteroids. So uh, they consist of nearly equal parts of meteoric iron and silicates, uh, usually a mineral called forsterite, uh, which is it comes from a, it's the most common type of a mineral from the class that's, that's called olivine broadly, uh, the olivine group. And jewelers often call this beautiful uh, yellow greenish uh, gemmy mineral peridot. Uh, and it's typically, it consists of a spectrum of impurities, if you will, of other elements, but it's typically broadly magnesium silicate. And uh, what happened is that these olivine crystals uh, in, within the asteroids uh, sank to the boundary of the core and the mantle uh, and rafted there, what geologists call rafted, and, and that locked them up uh, in a sort of a co-equal balance with the iron nickel 
that's in these very beautiful mineral meteorites that can be cut and worn or displayed and so on. Then we have the somewhat common, uh, but not nearly as, as common as stones, iron meteorites. They're, they represent the core material from asteroids, the very dense iron nickel. They're metallic. They have roughly, uh, this varies a good deal more than was thought years ago, but they're generally speaking about 90% uh, iron uh, and a, roughly 7%, although it can be greater uh, nickel, and there are other trace elements uh, as well. And as far as meteorite collecting goes, we'll talk about this more next week, uh, but there's a warning with iron meteorites, and that is what does happens to iron stuff. Oh, David has one here. He's showing us an iron meteorite ring. Um, and the only danger risk there to collectors, of course, meteorite collectors have to have all types, of course. But iron meteorites uh, over time require some maintenance because what does oxygen, which is very valuable to us, like to do but to react with things? And so eventually over time, iron meteorites rust. But there's a way you can get around that. We'll talk about that next week. And then there are the exotic kinds, even though they're stones. We'll talk about them next week as well because we're going to look at so many other types of stones tonight. And those are the lunar and Martian meteorites, which are very valuable and very rare um, compared to ordinary stones. So there's a huge spectrum. You can go to the Tucson Gem and Mineral Show in David's backyard every February there that happens for several weeks. You can go to the Munich Mineral Show or other places as well. There are many, many good and trustworthy and reliable meteorite dealers as well and get common simple meteorites for $5 for a small specimen all the way up to, I've seen it, Tucson lunar, large lunar meteorites, uh, hand-sized lunar meteorites for sale with a marked, with, you know, not with don't ask unless you can afford anything, which is sometimes what they say, price on request but a marked price of $200,000. So the range of collectors here is, is uh, across a big spectrum, which makes it easy to get into this stuff regardless of your uh, level and, mm -hmm. and depth of interest. So we'll look at some stones tonight. This is a slice of a very common stone. NWA is a very common abbreviation, which stands for Northwest Africa, because so many of these meteorites are found by locals, and it's not known exactly where they're found often in Northwestern African deserts. So uh, whether it be Morocco or Algeria or elsewhere, they get an NWA number usually. This is a pretty common one, but a good size piece. And you can see the chondrules, the bits of what were formerly in the early days of the solar system, uh, molten droplets of material that then cooled and solidified within this meteorite. This was one that was found uh, in Algeria in 1999. This is a relatively well um, uh, known famous meteorite. And, and this is one that shows that this is a complete little stone and it's really brightly illuminated here. I just took these photos last night again, um, because why not, you know, take new photos of things all the time. But this is one that has a really rich black fusion crust in ordinary lighting. It's called Cameldonga, um, and it's from a region in Western Australia uh, and is an unusual type. It's called a eucrite, uh, this stone, and it was found in 1984. And this is one that's somewhat treasured because of its very rich black fusion crust. Mm. Meteorites are not warm. They're not hot when they hit the ground, if you could instantly pick one up when it lands. Uh, but they do go through a very brief uh, superheating uh, through, the, er, through Earth's atmosphere and get this black fusion crust, which is one way that, uh, to differentiate them from Earth rocks uh, in regions where some meteorites have fallen. Here's a very famous one. This is a four centimeter piece of Chelyabinsk. You may remember the, the most famous moment for uh, window, windshield mounted uh, uh, cameras in Hi. Russia when the Chelyabinsk meteorite fell in 2013 and, and many, many stones were uh, recovered in Russia. This is a, a decent little sized piece of it. 
Um, and I remember at the Tucson gem show, the Russian dealers claiming, you know, on swearing on a stack of Bibles. At one point in 2014 at the Tucson show, there were more Chelyabinsk meteorites in Tucson than there were left in Russia. I don't know if that was true or not, but that's what they claimed, trying to all make a lot of money off of this recent, very famous fall. This is the outside of a little stone of Chelyabinsk that was recovered there. And this is the inside of the same piece. And you can see oh. the uh, mineralogical difference of the, the fusion crust there, uh, which is pretty brightly illuminated here. Um, but also the inside and the the uh, stone, which is a kind of basalt-like rock in here from that Chelyabinsk fall. This is one that uh, the favorite meteorite of Chicagoland uh, some years ago in 2003 called Park Forest that, that fell and broke up uh, above Chicago and uh, got some famous press there. This, this is a fairly... A small piece, but a, a nice slice of that meteorite showing you the internal composition there. And this is one of the most, perhaps the most studied meteorite uh, that there is. Allende uh, in Mexico, there were two very famous, 1969 was a tremendously good year for important meteorite falls. This was one of the two very important ones, Allende. And this contains, uh, it's a very primitive early meteorite, meteorites that come from far away from the main belt, much farther out in the Kuiper belt and farther out in the solar system are more primitive and they're older, generally speaking, and they're called carbonaceous chondrites. And this one is a, the most famous of all the carbonaceous chondrites. And you can see in it these little white um, uh, blobs. And again, these are bits uh, of what were liquid molten material in the early solar system and they solidified and, and as they cooled. And these are called calcium aluminum inclusions and are some of the earliest bits of material that we have from the solar system that do predate Earth. So this is an important one that has very primitive matter in it. Mm. This is an even rarer one now in terms of a primitive carbonaceous chondrite um, because of the amount that fell. This is the other 1969 famous fall. It was, it was a good year for, for um, organics in meteorites as well. This is Murchison, which is an Australian fall. This is a pretty small piece of it, but it's pretty rare stuff. And it also fell later in 1969. And it was the first meteorite that was recovered that was studied and known to contain uh, about half a dozen amino acids. The most common amino acid is glycine. And, and there were some mm. others in it as well. And these are, if you will, uh, uh, organic compounds that are uh, uh, constituents of proteins and therefore are thought pretty widely to be uh, some of the more primitive organic compounds that are essential for life. And we have a lot of these things in us now as well. It's also some of the oldest material, the Murchison meteorite that we have on Earth that predates Earth as well and the, the accretion of Earth. So this is old time solar system stuff. And then we get even older if you want to as well. This again is a pretty small sample of quite a rare meteorite called Tagish Lake that's Canadian. This is a one centimeter, very small piece, but it's the most primitive carbonaceous chondrite uh, of them all. And it fell in 2000. There were about 10 kilos recovered. It's possibly linked uh, spectrally to an asteroid called uh, Ermintrod. Um, but what is known is it has the most, uh, uh, um, it, it has a, uh, atoms and molecules of the most primitive matter known uh, that, that are constituents of pre-solar stellar dust grains. So this wow. is stuff that uh, goes back to the era of the formation of the sun before the sun's ignition. Wow. So this is really about as old as you can get uh, that we know of, at least thus far, of material that we can hold in our hand on Earth. You're crazy. That's... Uh, David, I, yes, I'm sir. curious. Uh, how do they, um, how do they know 
that there were amino acids in there. Are they, are they, do they do like some, uh, they cut it, they measure it with like some sort of uh, uh, gas um, uh, or, or sp spectrally or how, how do they do it? Yeah, you have a variety of, of chemical and physical analyses that now can be done to to um, that's that's chromatographic and and mm -hmm. also looking at the elemental composition of things uh, with very expensive uh, lab equipment, um, and so you can look at a a a an inventory of of the atoms that make up a piece and study the molecules that are in a piece and also look at compounds like amino acids that are fairly complex compared to really small things, uh, but can be identified uh, through their spectra and, and mm -hmm. through um, essentially destroying a little piece of it and then analyzing the result uh, through a variety of equipment. Here. So, so many uh, of these really meteorites are far rarer than any diamond, I would imagine. Yeah, they're rarer than diamonds. And remember, diamonds were one of the, they're, they're rare because they're hard to find largely. But yeah. um, diamonds were one of the first 12 or so uh, minerals in the solar system. Uh, and and their diamonds are rarer subsequently than gold. Gold is rare and treasured because it's really hard to find as well. But there's a lot of gold and a lot of diamonds exist, although they haven't all been found, of course. They're hard to find. Sure. Um, compared to this kind of material. Yeah. Now, more people are interested in gold and diamonds than having a Tagish Lake meteorite specimen. So right. the market drives the value of things, you know, right. as well. But in terms, of, in terms of the true scarcity of stuff, this stuff is really scarce. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. Um, so then this one, uh, Milba Lily, which is another famous Australian well, this fell in 1960 and, and about a thousand kilos. It's reasonably plentiful um, were found. And, and this is something that we're really, you talk about identifying uh, compounds and molecules and atoms that are constituents of matter. And this was something that was in its early days uh, 60 years ago. Um, but now if enough money, institutional money can be thrown at it, it's pretty straightforward uh, to analyze substances like that um, technologically. But we're in the very early days still with meteorites of determining where most of them come from, because we're looking at things that are broken up and mixed and heated and recrystallized and this and that over long, long, long periods. So it's a tremendous puzzle, the origin of meteorites, yes, asteroids and the moon and Mars, but the specific parent bodies of meteorites, that's a very tricky and difficult problem to try to uh, eke out that we're in the very early days of. However, there's a class of somewhat rare meteorites called the HED meteorites. And we'll look at some of those maybe next week as well. Um, that have very uh, uh, specific um, properties and spectral signatures, and they match this one included, Milba Lily, uh, these calcium rich eucrites, uh, the E and HED, this class. Mm -hmm. uh, they match the spectrum uh, uh, of the asteroid, one of the most famous asteroids there is, and that is Vesta. So these are believed to be bits of Vesta that were broken off and uh, a long, 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 long time later made their way down to Earth's gravitational field and ended up uh, uh, some of them in Australia and in other places. So we were on the cusp of beginning to figure out for some of these where they came from, but that's a very difficult problem. Hmm. Here's one that we do know where it came from, and that's because this is a historical first in meteorite science. This is called Almahata Sitta, and this came from a wonderful dealer uh, who's very well known at Tucson and in the field called Ann Black. She had a large amount of this material. This is, uh, a, again, a small piece, but this is rare stuff. Um, this is uh, named from a region uh, that means uh, um, the, it, it basically means a rail station in the middle of nowhere, El Mahatasita, um, uh, from the Sudanese desert. 
And this fell on October 7, 2008. There were about six kilos recovered of this stuff, not a tremendous amount. And the thing that makes this really neat is that it was discovered, the, the incoming asteroid, it's called 2008 TC3, was discovered and tracked by the boys in Tucson, by the way, on Mount Lemmon, uh, as it was coming in and then witnessed the fall and recovered in the Sudanese desert. So this was the first time ever that a small piece of an asteroid was seen on its way in to collide with Earth and then subsequently recovered. And that's quite remarkable. Mm. This is a fairly famous one because of its kind of high iron content, which colors it green with this kind of weirdo green look. These are fairly small bits that are about a centimeter and smaller in size. But these I'm kind of proud of because when I went on an expedition to Tunisia with a group from Astronomy Magazine in 2011, we went to the Tatahuin field, uh, strewn field, and I found these. And we were there with the director of the, the Geological Museum in Tatahuin, who blessed us looking for some small pieces of it. This fell in 1931. And so these are the only meteorites that I personally have found and incorporated into my collection. This is also, by the way, the origin of Tatahuin is also Vesta. It's also in this HED, D for Diogenite group this time. You also chose a very good date to find that, March 23rd. It's my favorite date. Yeah, Your March 23rd. <laughs> David, tell us. Well, March 23rd is my favorite date for a number of reasons. It is the day that Wendy and I got married. Oh. It is nice. the uh, date that I first saw Clyde Tombaugh's variable star in outburst. Mm. And finally, it is the night that we took the two discovery pictures of Comet Shoemaker Levy 9. Oh, wow. But while I've got your attention, I'd like to ask you a question um, regarding the iron and nickel meteorites tending to. The one that I was showing you, yeah. this one, is a, um, is a Gibeon yes. meteorite. And it is partly iron and partly nickel, but it's been outside in the rain and in the snow, and we drove over it with a truck and everything, and it has never, ever rusted. And they say that the nickel content is pretty high in this. Is that yeah. true for the Gibeon? Yes, you're absolutely right about that. Gibeon is among the, the densest and hardest and also with a very high nickel content. I mentioned this business of 90% iron and 7% nickel, but it actually varies a good deal in some cases up to almost 20% nickel. And I think you're right, Gibeon has a high percentage of nickel, which makes it sturdier. So you'll see rings and watches and pendants and other things often cut from Gibeon because it's also plentiful. And, and very sturdy uh, compared to many of the iron meteorites. So you're exactly right, David. And maybe, just maybe, some David Levy oil wearing it all the time maybe actually protects it from some oxidation a little oh, bit, yeah. too. Mm -hmm. You know, but but we'll talk next week. There's a secret for, for the more uh, susceptible iron meteorites We'll talk about how you, if you really love your iron meteorites, your typical iron meteorites that are a little less durable than Gibeon, what you need to do every five years or so is bake them in an oven and then coat them with, with a varnish. So we'll talk about that next week when we get to irons. But you're absolutely right, David. Gibeon is probably the sturdiest of, of and most resistant of iron meteorites. And it's pretty plentiful too. Yeah, it was a big fall, and yep. they're all kinds. They're very easy to get. Yep, uh, they're very really easy to get. Relatively inexpensive, and this is actually my wedding ring. Wow! Well, what stories nice. you have connected to Gibeon and also to March twenty third? Yeah. Wow! I Look just at that. To show that to everyone. That's fantastic, David. 
Mm. Even more remarkable, he drove over it with a truck and yet it didn't wilt <laughs> or uh, break. That also, <laughs> I'm sure, represents your marriage. No, it wasn't a truck, Adrian. It was the, um, the launcher that moved the Apollo and shuttles. Oh, my God. To, um, the launch pad. We put the ring underneath that and we have the launcher drive over it a few times. And if you believe <laughs> that, I'll sell you a bridge. <laughs> Is your Timex watch also in there? Yeah, yeah. Timex watch. The hell with Timex watches. Let's get David into a commercial. <laughs> Just kidding, everyone. But, but well, give me in okay, so David Eicher is sharing his screen right now, so we can't see David's ring, uh, David Levy's ring. But uh, after, after, towards the end of this uh, program, we'll have David show his ring. Up close, so and I'm just about done here, Scott, with yep. with part one of of meteorite. So there was Tatahuin, and then there's one more that's sort of an ordinary chondrite, but it's a nice shows you a nice slice. Someone with a meteorite saw, you know, and you can see I pr think probably the the little uh, indentations from the saw blade here. This is back to another fairly ordinary one, but it shows you what a nice uh, typical stony meteorite slice looks like. This is NWA 91, which is a uh, Moroccan, which is a huge numbers of meteorites have been found uh, by Moroccan, you know, kids running around in the desert and they win the, you know, eBay contest of the week and, and make some coin there. So thank goodness for that. And, and uh, that, that's it. And I will just quickly mention, Scott, if I may, we're on the cusp sure. of two big things in my world. One of them is Starmus. We're about to go a couple of weeks from now, and maybe we'll even do a little reporting from Armenia if we can Yeah. there. And we'll have all kinds of fun people giving talks and playing some rock and roll there and all kinds of fun there. Uh, and then also, uh, we're uh, about, uh, oh, three weeks or so away from the release of the book, A Child's Introduction to Space Exploration by myself and the distinguished fellow Tucson resident, David Michael Bakich. There awesome. we produced this. And, and so that was fun for us. So anyway, that's part one of dancing through the meteorite world. And uh, I'll do the final part of it next week again, if I can. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love meteorites. So I'm yeah. uh, very excited to hear about more of those. Uh, and it caused me also to look up Ann Black's web yeah. website um, called Impacta. Impactica. Impact Impactica is Tika. Ann Black. She's in Denver. And of course, our pal Jeff Notkin is in Tucson there who, who has Aerolite meteorites. AE Aerolite uh, and, and there and Mike Farmer is there in Tucson as well. Many, many uh, great meteorite uh, dealers from which you can yeah. get great specimens. Yeah. Yes. Right. And they are reasonably priced. So they can be very inexpensive. But if you yeah. insist on having, you know, you know, I'll tell you, well, no, maybe I'll, I'll save a story for next week. But okay. if you want to have if you want to have a you know, a piece of the moon or, or Mars that you can, you know, hold up in your hand and it's reasonably chunky, you're going to have to bring what they say when you go to Tucson every year, bring all the money you can and more. And more. That's the slogan of the Tucson. And I'm knocking show. off yeah. some banks on the way. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's where everyone is happy if you're a collector, you know, with your wonderful collection, except for your banker. You know, <laughs> that's right. That's never right. talks to you again. You know, yeah. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay, so let's take a good look at uh, David Levy's ring here. Yeah. So, you want to put that up close to the lens there? David, I'm going to, uh, go ahead and show us your ring. David. There we go. Oh, there it is. A true meteorite lover, and his ring. Yeah, beautiful. Wonderful. Now, for those of you who still believe that the uh, Apollo Saturn transporter <laughs> ran over it, um, <laughs> Peter, you'd believe this. We got into the transporter and drove it over and under and back and forth <laughs> over the uh, ring, and it never squashed. And if any of you still believe that, you shouldn't be at the Global Star Party. <laughs> That's right. Anyway, what is true is that I've lost this ring a couple of times, and once hmm. 
was wow. out in the observatory for a couple of months. It never oh, got no. rained on, but it did, was exposed to a lot of dampness and uh, before I found it. And uh, it has never rusted. I really love this. Well, it also has the superpower of David H. Levy with it, though. <laughs> That's right. That's right. A very <laughs> impressive superpower yeah. indeed. <laughs> well, wonderful. Well, thank thanks. you very much, both of you guys. And um, uh, up next is um, uh, Adrian Bradley with his uh, incredible, uh, awe inspiring nightscapes. All right. Well, first, I will. Um, I'll start by showing a close up of my rubbery, not so impressive wedding ring. But as we've learned, it too is made of star stuff. So um, everything ultimately is <laughs> every, everything ultimately is. So if that's Absolutely. what makes me feel better about my um, ring, well, the fact that I've gotten back into athletics, I catch for hardball. Um, so if I have this on, this doesn't impact me as much if I'm catching someone who can throw the ball pretty good. But um, so I wanted to start with that because I didn't want to feel left out. And I'm going to share my screen with an image um, that I think sums up the, um, the words that were a part of our star party. Um, the cosmos is within us. We are made of star stuff. We are a way for the universe to know itself. And I think this image shows that in action with a few of photographers from um, a group that I'm a part of came to another astronomy group that I'm a part of, the University Lowbrow Astronomers. This is our observatory. You can barely see our telescope here as it's open. I'll find another good image of that telescope for you um, later. But um, here we are staring up and the center of the Milky Way tends to represent, although there's all of these stars here, um, it turns out to be the galactic center that tends to draw the most attention, especially for those of us that do a lot of nightscapes. So this is sort of, to me, it's sort of a metaphor of the universe trying to understand itself as we look up at the Milky Way. Really quickly, I'm going to zoom into this region here. Um, David, you actually started me on a um, quest through my images when, let me pull it up, Bade's Window, your latest newsletter is about Bade's Window. And that window it's, exists here within the part of the galaxy. And what's also interesting is that there's this region called sweeps, which I have to look up really quickly. Sagittarius window eclipsing extrasolar planet search, which um, if Wikipedia is right, then in 2006 is when they um, did that survey. You can see where the sweep survey was in this region of the Milky Way. And in this region, where this star of Sagittarius is, in this region is where, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, it's a German name, Bade or, or Bad or Bad. There's, I'm gonna go with Bade, but I'm willing to be corrected down the road. But within this region where these two stars are, um, which belong to, Sagittarius, you can see the main stars of Sagittarius here. You can see M22 is here and M8, the lagoon, and even some of the Triffid. And as I've talked about in previous star parties, the longer your exposure and the more detail you get, the more interesting stuff you can find here. And so it left me wondering, let's just suppose, let's just suppose we're doing a pretty picture to put on the wall, something like this. Um, these are likely satellites 
and not so much, um, in fact, they may be geosynchronous and not so much uh, meteors here. But even in a picture, <coughs> excuse me, even in a picture like this, where we're going for beauty more so than accuracy, we still have a fairly visible region, this bright region here, um, where the sweeps was conducted. Bade's window is still, you can still see the area here. And to describe it, it's a window within all of this cosmic dust and, um, and things blocking our view of the center of the galaxy. But if you train your telescope through here, um, you're looking, all of this light right here, you're looking at starlight that is close to the galactic center. It, it forms a window of sorts into the center of our galaxy. So when uh, so reading that newsletter newsletter article by uh, Dr. Levy, my who also my dear friend David, um, it gave me another perspective on all the images. I look all the time at um, landscape astrophotographers who focus really hard on trying to make this as beautiful as possible and all they ask of the sky is just to be in focus. Sometimes even small star trails will do as long as the composition works. For my side, I tend to make sure that this is accurate. And lately I've paid a little more attention to the foreground, but I'm known for taking pictures like this, where it's just an observatory and trees. This is the night after all of the photographers were there. And here you have the lone Milky Way by itself in a panorama. Here's one of those meteors coming in, but generally isn't gonna make it to Earth. So we'll never know what this is, unless by the type of uh, streak and the color of the streak, maybe tells us what type of meteor. And that's something, uh, David, if you're listening, um, I may ask about that um, at a later time. But um, once again, now we see a little more detail. There are a couple of globular clusters that are a part of the um, of Bade's window. And those two, if I can find their names, um, I believe I can find them here with um, the description, this, this URL right here is a pretty good description of who Wilhelm Heinrich uh, Walter Bade was. And, um, and in this region, there's many more things that, um, that this gentleman is known for in astronomy. This little piece talks about um, Bade's window and one of the globular clusters, the brighter one is NGC 6522. There is another one there, um, which I believe is 6528. Um, two globular clusters. And you probably won't believe me, but the light from those globular clusters is where my hand is. That's 6528 and that's 6522. If and this was shot with uh, 35 millimeters, um for 30 seconds and then st stitched together in a 20 panel panorama just enough light at this location to get light from those globular clusters as well as some of the surrounding stars and the dark nebula appears here so it's it makes your milky way shots go from just being really interesting to learning some using them to learn something about what it is you're shooting at and if you can take a more detailed image you see even more you see even more goodies here the dust lanes that surround and that are around the window here we zoom in and see if we can pick up okay these globular clusters are a little brighter now 6528, 6522. Here's the area known as Bade's window. This is where the sweeps 
um, field. And interesting enough, when you image the center of the galaxy, this region tends to, ex if you expose long enough, this tends to be the brightest part of the region. The region known as Bade's Window is here. If I'm not mistaken, it's this entire area. Um, so <clears throat> there's even, <clears throat> excuse me, I just got done eating. So um, a lot to discover. You know, I, I've always been a proponent that when imaging the Milky Way, it can be more than just a pretty picture of the galaxy. There's there's things you can learn about it. Things like how long the the rest of uh, the Lagoon Nebula extends out this way. And when you can image with a small aperture, such as a 35 millimeter lens and begin to get dust lanes into Trifid, you know that you're pretty sharp. Um, and I think I've walked up the Milky Way before, but a challenge to us Northern Hemisphere shooters is to get, I've seen this called the lobster claw. There had, there's another colloquial name for it. Um, unfortunately, the NGC numbers of these two nebulae um, pass, um, pass me by, I have to look them up. Um, but getting them can be a challenge in the Northern Hemisphere, seeing as that there, this is the area where light pollution domes tend to rise up. So these tend to be covered your Milky Way shots in the Northern Hemisphere stop at where you can see M6 here and you can see M7. But you've got the Cat's Paw Nebula and the, a part of the Lobster Claw. This one is doesn't have the same form. You know, it's not a definite, but you can see the light here. Any camera modified to allow more HA um, emissions that it'll pick up and assign it a color within red. Very similar to what the James Webb does, reassigns RGB colors. Um, the visual colors that we can see basically slides those colors over to um, wavelengths in the infrared and then starts it all over with the near infrared being blue all the way to the far infrared, the most distant of things we can see, then gets the dark red, the dark reddish color. So the, your own DSLR can do the same thing. It, it assigned these nebulae, which give out emissions in an infrared or you know an H alpha spectrum. It gave those the color, so then we see them in our image. And then over here, the beginnings of the Roa Fuyuki complex. It takes a lot longer exposure, I believe, to get the blue to really come out here. The glow of Antares shows up, and there's the shape of Messier 4. And because of my processing, you know, there's some extra lines here. These planes did show up and photobomb this image, but a lot of good things still showed up. And um, this, this is one of the smaller galaxies. I, I won't guess the number, the number 6277 is coming to my mind, but don't quote me on that one. Um, but smaller globular cluster for visual astronomers, there are plenty of things in here, maybe not these two, but plenty of clusters for you to look at. M23 came out pretty well here. My noise reduction software is what turned it from small circles and kind of gave it the look, but it also, it made the entire part of the galactic core stand out. Um, as part of an image. So there's a balance between scientifically showing M25 and its shape versus showing you know, an entire picture uh, really quick when you can see the shape of the swan in M17, the swan or the shape of the omega symbol here. And again, 35 millimeter image, you know that you're doing a pretty good job. These dust lanes here have, um, I think these are Barnard objects, these particular dust lanes. So I find it important, not just shooting the Milky Way, but trying to learn what you can about some of the things in there. Now there's definitely more scientific significance to these images and 
or the these objects and what they are studied for. Um, supernova remnant is a part of the Cat's Paw Nebula, so it's studied. So they don't just make pretty images, but sometimes they do. And you go back and you work on your entire presentation. This is an image that took runner up. I went back and reprocessed it to make sure I could keep all of the detail, but I wanted to do a little bit better job of showing what the park looks like without halos, which despite a runner up finish, I did have some halos here. This time I was able to blend it with um, less of a halo and show a little more of what the uh, land out there looks like. The Milky Way and more natural colors to what we see with our eyes for the Milky Way. And here you have somebody observing and moving around. So we capture all his movements during the two minutes of um, imaging of the uh, ground here. So we um, so we redid this, and this is this is another one of those images that, despite all the haze you're seeing here, we're still able to get some pretty good clarity on the number of the stellar objects that are along the plane of this galaxy. So it's, and at a Bortle 1 site, some of these things show up naked eye, like M6, M7, M8. Um, you can see some of these regions. You may not see the bright pinkish color that my camera puts on them, but you see the bright clusters that are involved within each of these. And you can you see those naked eye in a uh, high Bortal 2 or Bortal 1 zone. Here, you can barely see it at all, but if you image it, it shows up in the it shows up in the picture. And so a couple more that I redid. Um, interesting enough, I barely got any detail here. This is with an older lens. Um, I was still able to get some detail. The uh, bottom turns the the uh, El Sable River turns into kind of a foreground for it. More of a more of a pretty picture here. Um, still can see Barnard's E and the wild duck that we were just uh, talking about. I wanted to make sure I wasn't going to give any answers away. Um, this is where the wild duck cluster is within the plane <laughs> of the Milky Way. Um, so even even though it looks kind of like a, a fuzzy oblong shaped star, this is the actual cluster. Now I can't with a 14 millimeter lens, it's gonna appear just as much as a star as these others are. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's the cluster. So if I hey, leave Adrian. my hand up there, yeah, Adrian, zoom back yeah. there. It looks like that asterism is pretty interesting. It looks like a bowl. Where at, Jerry? Scroll, zoom in right there where your cursor's at. Okay. See the asterism there with the stars? Yeah. Looks right like a bowl. And right yeah. here. All yeah, along there, like sides. a string of pearls. Yeah. yeah. Doesn't this have a, a name, uh, Jerry? I think that I does. I don't know. I think it does. And I, uh, again, some more uh, homework for me to look up. I think there's a name for that asterism and yeah it does look like a bowl so when you're visually observing and if it's wide enough you can look for that bowl and then you'll find m11 right here where my hand is now and if i leave it there this <clears throat> gives you an idea of how high up along the plane of the uh center of the galaxy here how high up you should go to try and find it and then this great rift right here which includes the Cygnus Rift is off screen. I think it's, yeah, we just missed the Cygnus Rift, I think. But here, this is a great rift that shows up pretty nicely in this image. Um, it's a dark area um, along the uh, plane of the galaxy. Just blocks everything except the coat hanger, which is always one of my favorite, favorite star clusters to see if I capture as well as this little dark nebula, which we call Barnard's E. Mm -hmm. uh, in most, if you have just enough precision in mm -hmm. your Milky Way photos, this shows up. 
mm-hmm. next to Tars Ed the star. I do remember the name of this star. Um, real quick story. I think I'm running low on time, so I'll hurry up. But the star Tars Ed, we had somebody named whose daughter was named Tara that wanted us to come and show them the uh, stars. I showed him a picture like this, pointed at this star, put the name Tars Ed on it and said, this is your daughter's star. It carries your daughter's name and said we can't come out it was during during the uh, height of the pandemic so we decided not to come out to their personal party but we did send them this image and said this is for your daughter so milky way photography isn't necessarily for awards or likes on facebook or instagram you can use your images to make someone make someone happy who um, is interested in the star stuff that we are made of. And so it's, it's one way I like to use the images. I definitely love sharing them here in Global Star Party. I believe this is the, well, the last of two images I'll show you. This one, which was a reprocess of the uh, Milky Way over this heavily lit area. Mm-hmm. Just mm-hmm. to let you know, even if there is a lot of light in your area as long Mm -hmm. as it's not shining directly in your face it's still possible to get detail in a milky way photo it does not have to be pristine dark you just have to this was a single shot you aim at the sky um and you use your processing to split out um some of the light that bleeds in into the sky here um, this area is pretty dark. I would say somewhere between a high Bortal four and a and a um, Bortle three. Um, maybe I should say low Bortle four to high Bortle three, like three point eight or three point six or something. So the sky, this was visible, although I couldn't see any detail. Um, the structure of the Milky Way was visible, and it was visible as a white ribbon. And once again. This area, a little brighter than the others, Babe's window shows up in any Milky Way shot, even when they blend all of this out as a part of their processing to where you can't even see these nebulae, you still see Babe's window as a part of those images. And quick note before I turn it back over to you, Scott, Okay. this picture as well as another picture of the aurora will be in this brightly lit house over here that's the gift shop for the point bark lighthouse park okay and they they were happy to see pictures like this of their park at night yes and probably uh probably might encourage them to turn off more lights more often so they did they actually said they except for the lighthouse they they kind of need that one sure but they gave me a way to turn off <clears throat> these other lights and they were open to an astronomy night where they would turn off all of the lights except for the lighthouse fantastic and and let people look at the night sky so i will be pursuing that and updating everyone on when we can do that if we can't do that this during this camping season we'll look to do it um sometime um, next year so definitely in the works to have a night sky star party here at this park and it, very happy to report that. I was glad Thank they you, loved Adrian. seeing the images. So yeah, it's great so to once, know that your work's inspiring people to do that. So yeah, it's fantastic. Okay, back all to right. You, Scott. So um, uh, at this point, um, we're going to bring on uh, uh, Jerry Hubble, who has not been with us for a while. Uh, uh, there were people hearing Jerry's voice out there, and really excited to hear it. Um, Jerry, uh, thanks for coming on to Global Star Party with us. I see you're still at that star party. That's so. right. I, I live here. I live here at the <laughs> at the Almost Heaven Star Party. It's a perpetual thing. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah, the shadows <laughs> haven't changed anything. I mean, it's right. All I know it's, the weather's always the same. That. It's it's like California. Right? It's always the that's, same weather. That's right. But we're also going to bring on. Um, 
Ron and Teresa from the Badlands Observatory. You two, you three have been working together uh, uh, along with Wes McDonald, so four of you. Uh, let, me, let me bring you all on. Let me get out of here myself. All right, so I'm going to pull myself off. And Wes, uh, you are now on, okay? And uh, it's great to see everyone here. So um, uh, I think that, uh, uh, you know, Jerry and Ron and Teresa and Wes have uh, gotten to know each other pretty well. But uh, um, Jerry, why don't you introduce them and uh, uh, give a little background about Badlands. And so this is, this is I'll, yeah, I'll let uh, Teresa and Ron talk. But this is Ron Divig and Teresa Hofer. Uh, the Badlands Observatory, which is located, oddly enough, near the Badlands in in South Dakota. <laughs> so that's that's not a coincidence, by the way. So, um, so yes. So Ron contacted me last at the beginning of the year to do some work with them on the observatory, and I'm going to let uh, Ron and Teresa talk about that and talk about their observatory. But uh, we basically did an upgrade for their mount control system on their big 24 inch Newtonian. And it was a really good project for us at Explorer Scientific. And for me personally, it's a good challenge. And Wes uh, was heavily involved with it. Wes McDonald, my buddy there, right? Uh, he's in the shadows. Um, <laughs> he uh, he helped a lot. I mean, he I, I've, I don't know if how many people have heard, but I've had some medical issues over the last few months that I've been working through and, and Wes helped me tremendously on this project and helped to get it done. So uh, from that, I'll, I'll turn it over to, to Ron and Teresa to, uh, to explain about the Badlands Observatory and let them tell you more about it. Hi there, thanks for having us. And it's so good to see you, Jerry. Really, you did such a terrific job for us, both you and Wes, and we so appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, uh, we, to, to pick up on that part of it, uh, yes, we had contacted Jerry because um, our, uh, the, the mount uh, control system that we were using was horribly outdated uh, and required some really obsolete hardware and software to, uh, to control the telescope. Um, and so we really needed to get modern and we really needed a, a really uh, fantastic system and, and they were able to custom design the PMC, their PMC-8 system to fit the 26 inch Newtonian reflector that we have at Badlands Observatory that's sort of our flagship um, uh, instrument. And um, I think I'll, uh, at this point, uh, I'll let Ron talk about uh, the observatory, which was his, his um, project, what is it? Um, it was his project that he built the observatory uh, and saw first light with the telescope, which he also custom designed uh, and uh, fabricated the optics for. Um, so uh, that saw first light in 2000 and um, and he did a lot of research with that instrument. And now we're on a new mission that's that's geared more to public outreach. So I'll let Ron talk about that. Yeah, the uh, the original telescope control system that uh, Teresa was referring to there uh, actually was kind of state of the art when we put it in about 22 years ago. But as technology goes these days, uh, it doesn't take very long for something to become outdated, particularly uh, uh, anything that uh, requires on current operating systems <laughs> uh, to use with computers. Uh, but anyway, my, that original system was uh, uh, a Comsoft system that was uh, basically designed by Dave Harvey uh, in Tucson, Arizona. That, that system was originally designed to operate the 90 uh, uh, inch Bach telescope on Kitt Peak. And then he came out with other versions of that and that uh, that particular system became available for other uh, instruments. And uh, when I started that land of laboratory, uh, that was a system that I elected to go with. But anyway, the uh, 
the mechanical aspects of the system were still working fine, but it was just difficult to keep uh, uh, modern technology going when using a, a, a DOS-based uh, system in Windows 95, if you know what I mean. <laughs> so uh, anyway, that's where uh, uh, Jerry Hubble and the uh, uh, Explorer came in, and it's, it, and it's been an entirely uh, uh, wonderful procedure going through this upgrade and, uh, and dealing with, uh, with them. We did have a few challenges. I, I was just going to say we did have a few challenges on the startup, but nothing we couldn't work through. And it was really interesting, you know, to be able to do this remotely with Ron being our hands and eyes directly on this on the system, and Teresa also. So that's that's kind of uh, what Wes and I did when we started up the system. We did the initial commissioning of the uh, of the control system. Yeah, it, it was so enjoyable that at three in the morning when we finally got done having a complete terrible evening on the first night, Teresa said, well, that was a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> we heard that and, and we were struggling, you know, trying to figure out what the, uh, what the actual scale factors were for the mount, you know, and, and once we, then we got over that, actually the next morning that got cleared up very rapidly and away we went. <laughs> so it wasn't all of us, it was pretty good. You're not always muted when you think you are. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's the dreaded open mic. Yeah. <laughs> Jerry, and I, Jerry and I appreciated that comment. We understood where it was coming from. It was really oh, yeah. That was, we were, that was, we were kinda, if we could have been next to each other, we'd have been saying, well, that was a disaster. That was <laughs> good. Yeah, that was really good. Yeah, well, it was really fun working through all of that, uh, especially when uh, we have had all of us online at the same time. And you know, uh, I should mention too, uh, uh, in this program, particularly I noticed tonight, there's a, there seems to be somewhat of a common thread that seems to run through Tucson. It seems to me like uh, uh, almost everything uh, astronomical eventually runs through Tucson. And uh, that included me because actually the seats for Badlands Observatory uh, uh, kind of took a, a big leap forward uh, 1960, I guess, 68 through 72 or so, uh, I had the pleasure of uh, being employed at the University of Arizona there at Optical Sciences and Stewart Observatory. It was kind of a joint position. And uh, it was my experiences down there that uh, kind of planted the seed for someday putting together my own uh, observatory with a research grade instrument that I thought might be kind of fun to uh, uh, do some serious work with. And that's actually what's happened for the last 20 years or so. And uh, Teresa and I have been, been teamed up on this throughout that period of time. And uh, just within the last few years, we've kind of changed horses just a little bit. And uh, we've gone more towards uh, uh, the uh, public outreach and educational aspects. And of course, living out here in Western South Dakota by the Badlands and the Black Hills, uh it's a, a quite a big area for tourism and uh, we have noticed that in recent years that the focus of tourism uh, is taking a quite a change where a lot of people are choosing their destination vacations along the lines of dark skies and uh, is as many people as there are that come out here for the badlands and for uh uh for mount rushmore and for the old west town of Deadwood, uh, they're starting to uh, be just as interested in what happens after the sun goes down at night in terms of the skies. And so we've decided to uh, explore that aspect a little bit with our observatory. And so far, it's really become a kick. It's uh, we've really enjoyed uh, uh, sharing this information with the general public. If I could uh share my screen scott sure, here sure. i'll uh, just show you all a little bit about uh what we do here um this is just from our website uh badlandsobservatory.com um and as you can see we uh we have several links here uh and one of what what we do here is that we have um we actually have two levels of tours. Uh, we have daytime tours where people can come visit and look in our look at our galleries. 
We have a couple of galleries uh, uh, that are dedicated to the history of Badlands Observatory and are also dedicated to uh, amateur telescope making, which uh, Ron did for 35 years. And we also book night tours. So we have, we set out about, um, we set out about uh, eight instruments on our back observing deck. Uh, and we have night tours where we uh, invite people to make a reservation and come out and stay with us. Uh, we give them about a two and a half hour uh, tour of um, different objects through the through the telescopes and we have a mixture of uh, of commercial instruments as well as homemade instruments which is kind of unique and we're we're kind of proud of that we're able to to have people look through those and they really uh, seem to to really uh, get a kick out of that uh, during the day uh, this is the outside of our facility. We have, a, have daytime tours, as I mentioned, and we um, they're guided tours, uh, and people can come and, and go through our galleries. And uh, also, we do solar observing during the day. We have a hydrogen al alpha filter that we put on the 26-inch Newtonian, and we also have a white light filter that we put on an 8-inch um, Celestron out on the back deck. Let me just, if I can get up here. Um, this is our blog post and we try and post what's going on at the observatory. Uh, this was from an open house that we held July 1st. We had television coverage because that was the day we kicked off our daytime programming. And uh, so we were very fortunate that uh, it was so well received by the public and we had uh, television coverage for that. Uh, this is a radio telescope that we're currently uh, building at the observatory. This is as you come into our facility. Uh, we have a case where we sell asteroid South Dakota t-shirts because 25 main belt asteroids were discovered here at the observatory and mm -hmm. one of them was named after South Dakota. Uh, these are my images. I'm a photographer and with the Badlands nearby, there's plenty of, of uh, subject matter. Um, this is looking out to our observing deck from the front entry. Uh, so, uh, and these uh, galleries, this gallery uh, is on telescope making. And uh, this one is on the history of the observatory and the research that's been done here, uh, including participating in NASA's near Earth uh, near Earth object program to map uh, to map asteroids. So, great. Great. That's awesome. Um, let's. Uh, uh, are you uh, able to show a view of the observat of the telescope and the observatory itself? I think I can, yes. Yeah, somebody's got their mic open because we can hear that rattling in the background. I wonder who that could be. Oh, actually, I looked. Everyone was muted, Jerry. Everybody's muted. I think it's just. I think it's just. Yeah, it's just. It's just the mouse. Um, when mouse you're clicking. Microphone. Yeah. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Yeah, if it's near the mic that you're using, it's just picking it up. So it's no, it's definitely no big deal. Those pictures right. are awesome. Yes. There's a, while she's doing that, there's a terrific uh, 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 television report that was done on them. And Teresa, do you have a link on that on your website? People should watch that. That was a great piece they did for you. Yes, the link is on the website uh, with our blog of our um, about our our uh, our open house. We have a we have a webcam that's uh, located on the telescope where we can kind of monitor the motion of it. Uh, okay. From our, from our computer room down Great. here. That's while you there. guys are doing that, I'll find this. Um, I'll find this. Right. Video. Was that in one of your blogs as far as the uh, uh, television program link? Uh, 
boy, you know, I'm not sure. I believe, I believe that probably was yes. Okay. Pertaining to the uh, the, the grand opening. Grand opening. Okay. So, Wes, just just we can talk a little bit more about the upgrade, I guess, what or what the process we went through yeah, a little she, bit. She's up there working with the camera, so I, I'm a little bit distracted. Uh, yeah, uh, pertaining to the upgrade, Jerry, go on. Yeah. So, so basically, uh, we ran into a couple of issues that we worked through. Uh, some, you know, until you get into the project, you don't really know the full scope of what changes you need to make to the. And we made. We modified our existing firmware and software to make it work with your fork mount. It's a fork mount system. It was the first fork mount that we had done with the PMC-8. So we had to make some adjustments. The home position is different than on a gym mount. It's on the uh, on the Meridian at zero deck instead of at the, the right. North Pole. And uh, so that was a change. And then Wes, what else? What else did we have to modify? We had to do some rate changes, also. Yeah, in the process of of um, fixing things around so that it would work with this massive telescope, Ron wanted it to run only at, at, at about well, something under a degree, far under a degree per second. And it, when we first started our our because of various constraints with the motor and the gear ratios and all, we weren't going to be able to operate the thing uh, very fast at all. But in the end, we managed to, we had to alter the, the firmware around to make it able to run faster than it ever has, which allowed us to operate the mount at half a degree per second, which is a very stately, beautiful movement on this big, big telescope. Yes. <laughs> and it, it's, 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 it's uh, I, I, one day I'm going to be there and watch it in person. It's, it's got to be a beautiful thing. But it is uh, it is different than when zooming around on an Exos two at three and a half degrees per second. Uh, it's quite a bit different running at half a degree per second. Right. But that yeah. required that required quite a bit of upgrades, and it's beneficial to all the users that will be. We're working on a uh, another release which will allow all of the mounts to operate uh, in a, with a different kind of potential uh, top end. We're still not sure what that will be because we run into torque limitations. So we're, we're, but we do have firmware now that can support a much different and a much better motion on account of this project. I mean, it, we wouldn't have done it probably if we hadn't had, if we hadn't had to do it on the project. Right. It's nice to work on projects like this. I mean, it's a little bit like, uh, you know, when uh, Ford wanted to go to Le Mans and, uh, and win those races, they had to build you know, these, uh, you know, superior race vehicles. And uh, I think that uh, working on something, you know, like this really stretches our, uh, you know, abilities and engineering prowess, so. Yeah, I was excited about this project for that reason, Scott, that there's just mm -hmm. another challenge to help, you, help me learn more about, you know, building the system to fit different, different types of uh, mounts. Sure. Yeah, the, the uh... The system has improved in so many ways on account of this. Uh, there were many things in it that were uh, they were they were hidden uh, in terms of they worked okay, but they they were hidden in terms of being actual not the best implementation or actually even an error for anything except the exact application we had them in. And so those things were all found and, and it, it forced us to find those and correct them. And so everything is much better and tighter and beautiful uh, as a result of this project. Um, it was. And so great. that benefits everyone that uses a PMC-8, I guess. Is that right? Yep. Yep. And, Absolutely. And the last release had, had uh, very many things in it that were corrected and made better because of this, because of this work with the Badlands. That's awesome. And you know, from the standpoint here, one of the issues with that slower uh, uh, slew speed is because of the mass of the instrument. Uh, it's a 3,000 pound telescope and uh, with a 2,000 pound moving mass. And of course, that builds up a quite a bit of inertia in starting and stopping. So you have to be a little bit concerned about, you know, the ramp up and the wrap down, as well as the, uh, the overall inertia that that telescope makes if it's moving pretty fast. So I'm very comfortable with that, uh, with that uh, slower slew rate. 
And it, it kind of scaled down. It, it kind of reminds me of Palomar, you know. <laughs> right. <laughs> that, that's probably about the slew rate that they have there. <laughs> mm-hmm. But uh, but anyway, it's uh, uh, the the selection of motors uh, that you guys use are just fantastic. The torque matches up perfectly with uh, with all of those requirements, and it's uh, extremely quiet. It's just a uh it's a beautiful system to experience yeah that's one of the trademarks of our system i think is the quietness of the stepper motor system and uh actually on the smaller mounts it it and west can attest to this he's used this system out under the sky actually more than i have next to it but it sounds it sounds nice slewing up and you know ramping up and down and all and and doing its thing Okay, so this is, uh, you're seeing, I believe, if you can see that, that's a uh, just a webcam up in the dome uh, with a picture of the telescope. Um, and it's uh, connected down, so that's obviously upstairs, we're downstairs, it, it's connected through ethernet uh, and conduit to our computer downstairs, and then we access it through ASCOM remote server console. So uh, it's it's just worked out really, really wonderfully. We just love it. So, Teresa, you're using Alpaca for that? We are, yes. And you use Karst to seal to, uh, to as a planetarium and control end, right? Correct. Yes. Really. yes. Can you yep. put this thing in motion for us? You want to, where do you want to go, Ron? Uh, I, I don't want to, I don't want you to trigger the demonstration effect, which is when the telescope falls off the mountain. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, well, let's see. Yeah, we can demonstrate that. We'll just pick a point here. Uh, Demonstrate which? Uh, you, the falling off or the movement? <laughs> Get Kurt to seal up there. There we go. Oops. Okay. We're not connected at the moment, but we'll do that shortly. I think I've mentioned this story before, but that demonstration effect happened on the Keck telescope uh, during the 90, 1991 eclipse that went over Mauna Kea. Wow. And uh, the scope was not yet, the Keck one was not yet finished at that point, but it did have some mirror segments on it. And they had the dome open, I guess, like, like the, you know, to show the telescope, like you have the dome open here. Right. And uh, I guess in all their excitement, you know, the group that was uh, kind of showing off the telescope ran off and, and to to talk to uh, the other people there, and and um, the sunlight hit the mirrors, and then that started to burn the inside of the dome. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Anybody smell something? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Zoom out. That's, that's the, as an electrical engineer, that's the dreaded thing to look for. It, 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 right. Uh, it, the smell is the magic smoke comes out of That's something. right, the magic uh, smoke. Out of the electronics. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh. <laughs> I think with telescopes, it would be the vaporization of your coatings. Yeah. Mm. Are you up there? Yeah. Yeah, we want to show some motion. Huh? Okay. Okay, we're going to just do a little bit of a northwest slew for you, and you should be able to see some motion there in the image. There we go. Oh, yeah, look at that. That's nice. That's a pretty smooth slew. Yeah, that slew is just the way a big telescope is supposed to slew. That's right. <laughs> That's... Yeah, and life, I think, smooth as silk. Here, it's a little jerky because, at least on my end. On the video. Yeah, yeah the video. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's not the, the telescope itself. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's yeah, that under controlled. Um, we have a go. We have a push to giant equatorial mounted scope that's very heavy. I wish we had our motors working where it would slew on its own, because when it gets going, it's hard to stop that thing, and you don't want to bust an almost 100 year old telescope on the side of the observatory so right. I absolutely yeah oh that's beautiful 
It's good but to like see all, it move. Like all of our products. That's only half a degree a second, right? Uh, yeah. I, I think it ended up being about 0.6, isn't it? Oh, well, maybe. Well, I, uh, I, I think it's 0.5 on the button, uh, okay. Roy. Okay, that's right. It did end up there. Well, it looks like it's moving pretty quick, you know, so I guess I well, wouldn't it, move any faster. I mean, yeah. Just do a, uh, you don't do one on this thing, but just do a meridian flip at half a degree per second, and you won't think it's quick anymore. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, that's cool. That's cool. So I uh, I know that uh, Ron and Teresa have uh, guests tonight at the observatory, and um, uh, I'm really glad I was able to get them on uh, the program today. And uh, it was uh, also nice to have you, Jerry, and, and Wes come on as well. And um, so very much want to thank all of you. And uh, We'll come back some other time and maybe um, uh, see some live views through that telescope. That would be really cool. That would be excellent. You bet. Yeah, we look yes. forward to that. Good to see you all, and thank you so much. It was really our pleasure. Yeah. It's good to see you, Teresa, Ron. I'm, I'm glad to see you guys. Thanks excellent so much, presentation. And it's good to know the bad lens are for more than just typical landscape photography. So yeah. that's, uh, that's very good to see. Well, oh, yeah, there's good. definitely some good Milky Way photography in the Badlands. That's, so now I have add now, that to the number of places that I need to absolutely. travel. Absolutely. If you haven't, if you haven't done it, it's a yeah, must, yeah. must do. Well, I'll, yeah. I'll be coming out. I'll be coming out soon, Ron, Teresa. I'll good. be coming out soon to see the scope. We look forward to that, Jerry. It'd be great to see you. Mm -hmm. I'll let him near it. Trust me. <laughs> Don't touch that. Yeah, I want to make this a little better. Let me tweak this some. <laughs> All right. That's great, guys. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. Well, next up is, is uh, thank you, Wes. Um, next up is uh, uh, Maxi Filares. Maxi's down in, uh, as you all know, if you watch Global Star Party, you know he's down in Argentina. He does amazing astrophotography. Uh, we're glad to have him on tonight. He's been a little bit under the weather, but I'm glad he was able to come on today. So thanks, Maxi. Thanks for coming on to the 102nd Global Star Party. Hi, guys. Well, thank you again for inviting me. Uh, well, it's it's good to to hear that uh, you, Jerry, you're you're here with us again. So I'm glad to. Yeah, Maxi was asking about you just as uh, oh. just as we were kind of putting this all together. And I said, well, you know, he said, how's Jerry doing? I said, well, ask him yourself. You know, he's going to be on tonight. So. Yeah, thank you, Maxi. I appreciate that. Yes, I'm doing pretty well. Uh, it's much better now. So I appreciate that. Well, I'm, I'm glad to hear. So, well, uh, tonight what I'm going to show you is some kind of pictures that I've been doing in planetary way, but I have uh, my equipment, it doesn't prepare to do a planetary astrophotography, but it's what I got right now. So uh, I was watching the weather and some nights says it was a bad seeing, uh, in the, we had bad layers, really tough. Uh, but anyway, I put out my equipment. I'm starting to do some testing in my telescope uh, because I have an F4. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay, do you see it? Yes. Okay. Yes, we do, well, Maxi. Well, this is my telescope. This is an eight inch a uh, four telescope and uh, now i have more automatized automatized uh, because i have my zwo uh, acr plus and also uh, a zwo uh, a electronic focuser so uh, when i go remotely i can connect this and well get focus but also i have my filter wheel and uh, that is motorized too and connected to the SCR plus so when i connect my camera i can do 
uh, pictures uh, in different uh, filters. But here I have a 3x uh, Telex standard uh, Barlow, so I can uh, go more uh, focal because even this telescope is a, is really huge in the diameter, is really short uh, in the focal length. But well, uh, I was practicing with uh, Saturn, preparing to do the 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 opposition. Uh, but I have really bad weather. Uh, the the wind was really tough, and this is the the image that I could get in that night. It was this was the the last GSP on Thursday 11 last week and and also uh, i was uh, i remember that i was doing some live view from uh, of the moon uh, i don't know if you remember but i was capturing almost 120 pictures that i stacked and processed in pipp and get a uh, six gigabytes uh, a file of that image to get processed. So when I do the the stack, I have this picture of the moon, and you can see it's more like yellow because this was the the shared ISED uh, method that gives me this. I think this one was yeah. You can see here at the edge is blurry here in this picture, also here, because this is the, the original stack picture. And then I crop and uh, deconvolution it so I could get more details uh, on the surface of the moon. Uh, you can see here there are some, a lot oh, of yeah. craters, plateau crater, and well, uh, I process this image. I uh, I use uh, pics inside, and I remember some uh, mini tutorial that uh, Gary Palmer did. So I was practicing on that uh, to get more uh, info. So when I process the image, I got this, and you can see here. I did a mineral moon to to re realize the the colors of the surface uh, by the minerals the, that has, and this is a really good one picture. I, I really love this. Uh, you know, I I process this too, but I I like this one. So. Uh, I wanted to show you a little conversation because uh, days ago, the 4th of August, I also did pictures of the moon uh, and there was a crescent moon here. And I want to show you the difference because when you see the moon in like this, you say, okay, but when it's full, it's almost, it's practically the same face. But it's not like like that simple. For example, uh, you can see this part of the sea, and I have here the the uh, in Photoshop the the picture of the, the the another picture of the moon, and watch this place, this edge from here at the left. You can see it's more outside, it's more far, and also it's almost rotating. That's because our perspective and the, the position of the moon. And also uh, the moon has uh, approximations uh, that, well, I don't know how to say in English, but uh, it's um, that we call here um, a apogeo and perigeo. It's the, the moment that the moon is go far away from the orbits of the, of the Earth and the, the moment of the the most proximately 
uh, near of the Earth in orbits. So you can see it's like a 3D image when I do this, but you can also see the the movement of the perspective and uh, around the surface. And for example, in this part, you almost have the edge of the sea, but in the full moon, you have a lot of more and it's it's amazing. Of course, this part, uh, you can able to see when it's crescent, but well, this is a, a little uh, experiment that I was uh, doing. Uh, well, the day is passing by and the 13th of August, we had really good uh, seeing that we say, that we call uh, the astrophotographers and the amateurs, because to do some planetary image, we have the method of the lucky imaging. Uh, that's uh, basically when you do a video, you have a lot of frames and you ch you try to choose the best of those uh, frames to get uh, stacked and then process to get the sharpening of the of the details of the object that you're taking. For example, uh, I started again with Saturn and I was practicing with the Barlow and then I added another Barlow, but I want to show you this one. Uh, for example, this is was a, this is an image that I took about eight thousand frames, and mm -hmm. I only stuck five percent uh, of this. And let me open it. And uh, yes, I have a really <laughs> I had too much frames here, so you can see that there's almost really blur. But when I do, when I work with the wavelets, you can see the the rings oh. and the details of the surface. And re yeah, and remember, this is an F4 telescope, uh, really short. It's not prepared for this. Uh, if you go more zoom, the details you cannot offer because also the diameter uh, plays with this. So you can go more <clears throat> more details uh, if you want, but I try not to do too much. So when I do, I, well, I, I have a monochrome camera, so I have to do uh, four videos uh, with a light uh, filter, with a red filter, the green filter, and the blue filter. So, so I can get the, the info okay. of the colors. Uh, so when I get saved, this uh, particularly frames, this is the red uh, channel. And when I get the focus, I have this. Uh, this is the green and this is the blue mm -hmm. channel. Uh, there's a lot of programs uh, or software that you can uh, do the, the rotation, but uh, it doesn't work a lot with my pictures because the rings of the of the planet it looks like uh, they are of, um, 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 I don't know how to say it uh, um, it's, it's really like a move it, it has movements I don't know and it's awful so I I say okay I have a short uh, focal so I don't know if uh, I did pictures of uh, videos of one minute and I don't think that has rotates too much to get a lot of information. So what I did, I went to PixInsight. I opened, uh, let me, this is Saturn here. Uh, I opened the L channel, uh, red, green, and blue channel, the, the four. And uh, let me see if I can, okay. Uh, I go to uh, LRGB co uh, combination, let me reset. And I put the, 
every every channel. But before that, I did the this little tip that Gary Palmer uh, did a couple GSP ago. Let me find linear fit here. I go to the uh, green channel and I put it on the rest of the of the channels uh, without the green okay? okay so oh i come back to lrgb combination and i gave apply global, global and we have the colored planet okay let me uh, turn this and you can see here we have a colored planet of a uh, saturn but we have still to uh, to get working because we have to uh, eliminate the this blur uh, light with the histogram and we can stretch a little bit from that mm -hmm. to get more and then i will apply it and here we go but I, I I don't know. This is a this is nice. A, yeah, this, this is this is nice. But the colors I in this case I don't like it too much because you can see there's more like red here. There's more like a green. So what I do here is this: I invert the image, go to S C N R to get out the the green then i then invert again and then i play it again this so you can see here hmm. all that red and green goes off right so when i go to a saturation for example you have more orange and the the, the the rings are more blue okay so i i like this more like this one that before i can if i go more it, it's like we say we we broke the file but uh, not to give too much to to burn it so hmm. or an f4 uh, eight inches telescope this is i think this is nice one of course Depends of the night because you remember this one with the same, the same, uh, the same uh, uh, equipment, and there's a lot of difference from here to do this and this. So, of course, you can do the, then the the rotation to get more sharpened on the surface. But I don't think that I can get a lot of more details that I have right now. Of course, maybe some kind of sharpening and that's it. Uh, but uh, the, the, the planetary astrophotography is completely different than when you do deep sky astrophotography. There's a lot of things that you have to, to make sure and well of course i have the, the the king of the solar system i pointed to jupiter also mm -hmm. and i was practicing with the point uh, putting the 3x barlow and also a 2x barlow uh, with the camera so i get more further but when i process the details there wasn't like a when I process the, the, the natural uh, file of the video, uh, I couldn't get a lot of details. So I remember that when I do astrophotography, the planetary astrophotography with the cell phone, uh, I had the same problem. So I resized the file here in PIPP. For example, this is... Uh, um, I think that for example this one you can see is h 
hundred for each hundred size. Uh, it, it's almost, you can see the, the sharper, but uh, here in the, uh, sorry, when you put planetary in the processing options, you can have the this option to resize frames. So you can do it from 400. So it's going to be the, the middle and the details get more compressed to get when you do the the, the convolution and, and work with wavelets, you have more uh, scale to work with that uh, details. So for example, uh, I don't remember, I think it was here. Yeah. Uh, open, let's go here. Well, in Saturn, I also did that, but it doesn't look like good to me. I don't, I don't think that I'm going to do it again, but I was practicing because mm -hmm. for the opposition for Jupiter, we have a lot of months, but uh, I think it was here. For example, this is the, the, the L channel. And when I go with the wavelets, I try not to go farther because I don't want to broke the file the processes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and I try to do the same with the say with the with the, uh, a other channel. So when I when in here in Jupiter you have to de rotate the images because the the rot the, the rotation of the planet it's really fast so uh, you remember the day in jupiter is on only nine hours from us uh, with us so it's rotate really really fast so i have to do you can see there's a lot of files this lrgb 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 uh, videos i was processing and working with the wavelets and you know two days I was with this and I think there's uh, practically in here I don't remember now the file was but I, I did a lot of files to, to work but here there's more details but it's like a broken file you can see the the, the gray red spot and the the, the the clouds that surround it, but and I yeah it was this I think this was the the finally process of of course remember I don't have a a planetary gear right now I hope someday like Nico. <laughs> But well, I I was uh, I'm still practicing, uh, you know, to 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 working with what I have. Maybe in the in the future when I get more diameter and more focal length, uh, of course, <laughs> there was going to be much better. But well, well, this is. All, uh, all for tonight. I hope that you liked it. And uh, well, uh, Thank thanks you, again. No, Thank it was you. great. It was great. It's nice yep. to learn uh, how to do techniques like that, just step by step. So really wonderful. It's sometimes it's frustrating, you know, when you, you, yeah. you don't get, you don't uh, finally get that uh, details. But anyway, you are doing astrophotography. You have to remember that. You have to get a, po a five minute pause and then continuing. Maybe you have remember something and something changed. And, but you are doing astrophotography and you are capturing an, another planet. So even, even more uh, when you do lunar and deep sky uh, astrophotography too. Right. So That's don't right, give up. Right. Don't give up. That's right. <laughs> and I think that what you showed, I mean, the images of the plants did look 
excellent to me. So I, I, <laughs> I know that uh, guys are really picky about this stuff. Yeah. But, <laughs> no, it's really, really very nice. So well, thanks thank for you. coming on, Maxie, and have a good thank night. You, okay. You, you too. All right. So uh, we are going to take a 10-minute uh, break and uh, come back with uh, uh, Marcello Souza down in Brazil. And then um, uh, we've got uh, Dr. Daniel Barth. So stay tuned.
did. How's that? Okay, I'm unmuted now. <laughs> Anyhow, we've had a great first session here. We started off with uh, David Levy and Peter Jedeke uh, singing uh, uh, music to us, which was uh, about how stars go kaboom. Um, uh, the Astronomical Leagues, Don Nab was with us uh, sharing the, uh, the uh, questions and answers that the Astronomical League does it on, on every global star party. Um, we had David Eicher sharing part of his meteorite collection with us and kind of schooling us on, uh, you know, just how rare uh, meteorites really are. Um, Adrian Bradley was up uh, with uh, his nightscapes and showing us uh, Bade's window uh, and explaining uh, uh, how we can see through that uh, through that window to uh, you know, part of the uh, center of our galaxy. Um, and then the, the good folks at the Badlands Observatory, Ron and Teresa, came on uh, uh, along with uh, Jerry Hubble and Wes McDonald, who worked on refurbishing that, uh, you know, 2,000 pound telescope uh, with the, you know, a pro version of the um, Explore Scientific's PMC-8 system. So it was uh, nice to see that whole system come online, and uh, it's the first time I've actually seen it uh, uh, completed so that that's uh, as far as moving and actually working and everything so uh, I was very pleased to see that uh, then we had Maxi Filares on from Argentina showing his processing techniques for Saturn uh, and the moon so thanks for 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 watching that um, uh, up next is uh, Marcello Souza down in Brazil uh, Marcello is the senior editor of Skies Up Magazine, and uh, he is also someone that is a powerhouse in uh, astronomy outreach in Brazil, something that he's done for many years. And so we're really pleased to have him on to Global Star Party again. Marcello, how are you? Hi, nice. I'm nice. I'm fine. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here, Scott, again. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Uh, I will share some information about this. Uh, on a moment, I will share my screen. About how the... I already showed part of what I will show now. Let, let me share. Yeah. Now we are begin to work with uh, 3D animations. This is one of our... Oh. Now I begin to, to make it 3D animations. And the, the next animated cartoon will be in 3D. Oh, wow. <laughs> Excellent. So these are sample clips, I guess. Is that uh, right? Yeah, make a test with these. Do your this students uh, do your students put these together, Marcello? Yes. Wow. Okay. Excellent. And it, it will be the next one, the next uh, animated cartoon that we're going to. This is a, a video that uh, I saw in Instagram. That is a, a, a this is, they you see a, a lot of photographers here. Oh wow. They resisted, Two times <laughs> per, per year, man. Right? This. Yeah. This is like Stonehenge. <laughs> it is in San Diego, if I'm not too wrong. You see the sun here. Oh, that's beautiful. You have a lot uh, of photographers. Look at that. That's cool. To resist these moments. One, two times a year. Mm hmm. And here is closer. I guess sometimes you can see the green flash. I don't know where, where, where it is, in what beach, but it's something fantastic. I know that is in San Diego, but where I don't. And here I will show you something that I found. 
and it is I talk with the guy that is responsible for this this homepage. That his name is Alfonso, and he is a doctor, a physician, and he has this homepage. I have all the models that you imagine, paper models of rockets and satellites, uh, space stations. That's a is a fantastic place. I will share now the his homepage on to show you because it is something that uh, I was looking for during uh, as during last year. And I found this and talked with him that he do a fantastic work with this. I will share now this screen with the home page. Uh, it's open here. This is the home page. Oh, I need to go there in a moment to move the home page. Ah, uh, here. And here you have all the models of the International Space Station. Oh, the chain zoo, everything here that you imagine he has here. You have here all the space stations in the history. Here's the International Space Station. And the, what's fantastic because he has all the information for people to build the, and there is a paper, uh, they are paper models. Yeah, I will open one of them here, the European section. And it, it's fantastic. You can download it. Everything is free. And here, you can download here the models. If anyone wants to, to make a presentation, a exhibition to show, is a place where you find many things that can help you to organize an exhibition about the space exploration or if you want to show the rocket satellites, it's a fantastic one. This is the link again. Uh, here. A AXM papers space models. Space scale models. Hello, may I add something here? Sorry? May I add something here? Yes, yes, for sure. Okay, so this is really interesting, really good you are sharing this, because I used to make many spacecraft from this website. So for example, I made a, a Soyuz spacecraft, made a big Falcon 9, really, really nice. Oh, great. Dude, like I can share some. Wait, and uh, we sometimes use in, in exhibitions, paper models, and they have a, a, a big success. Right? And it, it, what is important because kids can participate actively. Yeah? Yes. Uh, building the, the models. A really detailed. Now, now I'll talk about the Brazilian constellations. Uh, is a work done by this guy. Here already died, but he's Professor Germano Afonso. Mm -hmm. He is a Brazilian indigenous, he is not an indigenous, but he, her grandfather was uh, in, lived in a tribe here. And he, he tried to show to everybody the constellations imagined by the a special uh, tribe of Brazilian indigenous here, that is the Guaranis. Uh, M, M beer, Guarani M beer. And it's different from the way that we, we look for the constellations, we imagine the constellations. For us, the constellations, we connect the uh, most luminous stars, uh, and the Brazilian indigenous uh, didn't. Um, do the same. They did something very, very different from this. What they do is this. This is a region here. You have the Southern Cross, Alpha and Beta from Centaurus, Wolf, Scorpius here. And uh, what they saw here is not only to connect the most brilliant stars. They connect also, they 
look here, you have dark and uh, bright regions in the Milky Way. And they use this difference in the Milky Way also to help to build the constellation, the model of the constellation. Here, in this place here, they saw this constellation. That I don't know the name in English of this animal, but in Portuguese, is Emma. I don't know how to say it in English. It's like the one that you have in Australia, the big one that you have in Australia. That, and the, here you see the head of the, the bird here is in the... Is a, in Portuguese, it's Saco de Carvão. is a coal region here near the Southern Cross. Right, in Southern Cross. Maybe uh, uh, in, in translation English, maybe something like uh, uh, coal bag, something like this, this dark region of the Milky Way here in the Southern Cross. is the red, the red of the, the birds. Alpha and Beta from Centaurus. They are Jews here inside the birds. And here is Scorpius here is the last part of the bird here. This is the way that the, mm -hmm. this special tribe imagined this constellation. And I'll show now, you have another one, but I have something that is fantastic also about this. That is how, because you can see this in a software. I will show the software also. Here, you have Taurus here, and here the Pleiades, and they imagine another bird here that the name is Tinguaçu, yeah. also in the same condition. Yeah. Uh, they not only connect the most luminous stars, yeah. they imagine this region, this bird. This is Southern Cross yeah, that uh, you ever see. And uh, I'll talk something about the Southern Cross before I show the constellation in Stellarium. Uh, in 10,000 years, we will not see again the, the, the Southern Cross. We'll see a different image from Earth. And for us, it's very important because uh, we can find the South from the Southern Cross. And this, uh, uh, sorry, it is in Portuguese. This is a different tribe here that they call this Curuçá, that means cross in their language. Right? These are the names that they use here in Portuguese uh, for the star of the Southern Cross. I, I don't know, this is Mimosa. I, I, know, I think that is, everybody knows Mimosa. Is the cover. Here is the Magalhães stars. Here is, is Pálida in Portuguese. Rubidia, and this one that uh, don't belong to the cross, we call intromitida. It's something that uh, don't, couldn't be here, and it is here. And how that we you know the seasons of the year from the position of the Southern Cross in the beginning of the night? And for us, here is the South Celestial Pole, Right? Here and south, and here, uh, when the southern cross is in this position, the beginning of the night, then is the beginning of the fall for us. When the southern cross is in this position, the beginning of the night, it is the winter for us. In the other position, this side here, it is the beginning of the spring. And when we don't see the southern cross in the beginning of the night, is the beginning of the, the uh, sorry, the summer for us. Then we ever use the Southern Cross as a reference for us. And how that we find the South from the Southern Cross? We have something that we do when we go with telescope because you need to know the South to put the, when you have equatorial months and the, we use our fingers to find the, the, the south. We, we put it inside the two fingers, these two fingers, the main uh, direction here of the Southern Cross. And then we measure 
four times and a half this distance, and we find the south, the south celestial pole, and this is direction of the south. And this is what we do. We head south and cross, and you measure this distance four times and a half. And you arrive in this region here, and here is the polar uh, solar celestial pole, and this is direction of the south. Then we use it during the night to find the, the south. Is what to use. Mm -hmm. Then we, when you have the telescopes, you need to use our fingers to make this measure. We do this all the time, né? because it, it is better than you use the a bussel to do this. This is movement during the night. And the, I will show now uh, the Brazilian constellations in the Stellarium. If you want to see in Stellarium, it is possible because you have the Brazilian constellations there. On a moment, I will try to change for the Stellarium now. It is open. I don't know if, you, if you, it will work. I will try. You can see here the Stellarium. Right? You see, okay. I'm moving here. Okay. It's possible to see the movement here. Yes. I, I, I change the time here for the beginning of the night. Here you have the Southern Cross. Here, Centaurus, Alpha and Beta from Centaurus. Mm -hmm. And the, here, if you go here in the options, you have a Stellar Culture here, and you have an option here that's Tupi Guarani. That is the Brazilian indigenous, the name of the tribe. And here we do this. And here is the bird here. Here is yeah, the bird. I see. The big one. Eu call Emma. I don't know. Avestruz in, in, in Australia, in Portuguese. I'm trying to, to find the correct words to say to you. What is the animal? It's like an avestruz. Like an emo. Yeah. Oestruz. And you have emo also in, in English? Yes. Emo. Emo. Right? E -M -U. Emo. Right? Emo. Emo. Yes. yes. Is this one? Yes. Emo. And this is the emo here. In part, the red in the Southern Cross. This bag here, I don't know if correct term in English, and here is Scorpius here, and here are the two uh, luminous stars here, that is the bright stars that you have here, the Alpha and the Beta from Centaurus, and here is another, this is a Brazilian animal here, I let me come early here, oh sorry let me put here the no, it's okay. Here is another one that you call Anta. These are that you don't have in the United States. You have one in Brazil that is Anta. This is an animal from here that is also part of the animal is in the Southern Cross also. You have you see that you have constellation, the same different constellation, the same region. You know, like right. this. And you can find these constellations in Stellarium. Where I have even Stellarium also. It's a great program. Yeah, and here I will show uh, another thing. Let me share agora again my screen here. Uh, one moment. Oh, here are the contests that we organize. The two contests. This is a contest about astrophotography. This one about uh, articles for the and the, for the students from our region that participate. And you are giving prize. Uh, thank you, Scott. This is, was possible with thank your you. help. Uh, thank you. And this is the, another, again, I'm showing the cover of the last edition of the Sky's App magazine. And uh, everybody that wants to, to contribute will be very welcome. Thank you very much, Scott. Thank, thank you, you so much. much thank you, Marcello. That was wonderful. Okay, nice. and have a good night. <laughs> we'll uh, see you, see you not very you. soon. Take care. Okay, so um, uh, our next uh, speaker uh, will be uh, 
Dr. Daniel Barth. Now, Daniel and I occasionally, and, and Daniel pointed this out to me, uh, we occasionally kind of are on the same wavelength uh, in, in thinking about our presentations and stuff without even really calling or checking with each other or emailing each other or anything. And so, uh, you know, when um, I was thinking of the, uh, the mind-cosmos connection, uh, you know, he, he went to give a presentation on the anthropic uh, uh, cosmological model, which is basically the proper uh, technical interpretation of what I was trying to uh, get across here at Global Star Party. So <laughs> we are going to end Global Star Party with Dr. Barth's presentation. Thank you, uh, Daniel, for, for doing this. This is awesome. Hey, thanks, Scott. It's, this is like our third hole in one. <laughs> where I've done a program on how do you know, and then Scott's yeah. like, oh, we're doing that on Global Star Park. <laughs> right. uh, and we we really, we don't we don't plan these. It's just oh. <clears throat> great bowling balls roll in the same gutters, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, what we're doing tonight is the anthropic cosmological principle. And I put a couple books in the chat, but for those of you who want to dive deep, this is the book by uh, John Barrow and Frank Tipler. And uh, this is quite scholarly. Um, really will take you deep into the history of these ideas, but to give you an idea, the anthropic principle came up in about 1974. It's a fairly recent idea, but for a long time, I'm talking ancient Greek, Persian, Asian astronomers, people were looking at and saying, well, is What's the purpose of all this? Where did we come from? Why is the sky dark at night? Uh, how do we explain the planets and all these sorts of things? And for the ancient peoples, almost around the world, the idea of mind and purpose and best fitness for human use and consumption was a pretty prominent idea. Well, of course it rains to make the crops grow so we can have grain so we don't starve. The land is there and it's firm underfoot for us to walk on. Uh, the sun is there to warm us during the day and the stars and the moon are there to light our way at night. And it's all about me. You tell me about me. Uh, and it, it seems like kind of a very egocentric sort of an idea. But this idea is what we refer to as teleological. The idea that, oh, the universe has a purpose. And when we came into the medieval era, the Christian church adopted this idea that, of course, the universe is created, and God said, man shall have dominion over all of this, and name all the beasts and the creatures and the fishes, and the, the whole Genesis idea was that this was made for us. It was a purpose-made thing. Well, we get further along to Newton and company, Newton, Hooke, Descartes, <clears throat> and these guys say, eh, you know, all this crazy stuff about uh, the purpose of the universe is us. No, we don't, we don't like that. And particularly with the success of Newton's gravitational models and Kepler's uh, planetary laws of motion, Copernicus reordering the universe and saying the earth isn't the center anymore. How can it be the purpose made place if it's not the middle? Well, then they shifted over from teleological arguments <clears throat> to eutaxological arguments. Nature must have a cause. And these concepts are a little bit slippery. And I, I just, I had a lovely brainwave. And I thought, you know, I have to figure out a way to show people the, dif the difference between <clears throat> teleological and eutaxological arguments. And so this is a gadget. You've probably all seen one. They use these on game shows. You see them in, you see them in, in uh, arcade parlors. You see them. Uh, everyone who's done a science class in statistics has probably seen this. You roll marbles down through the little pin board and they fall into the little slots and they form this beautiful bell-shaped pattern. Well, in this, if you'd never seen one before, the idea that it makes this consistent bell curve would be a, quite a surprise. 
and science teachers use this for that very purpose. The bell curve is the teleological component of this. It's the hidden purpose that reveals itself over time as the marbles fall through the maze of pins. Now, you can't predict which way a marble will go. And yet you can predict that this bell-shaped pattern will emerge every single time. Another example of this, got a picture here of a salt mine where you're, piling, you're digging up salt and you're piling it. And it always forms a pyramid. If you've ever driven past any place that mines gravel uh, and earthworks and stuff like that, where you have the big conveyor belt that's putting the stuff and it forms this nice little pyramid. The pyramid, or if you will, the, uh, here we go, I think this is it, yeah. The pyramid or the little bell-shaped curve, this is the teleological end. This is the end purpose. This is what reveals itself over time. But it's the pins on this little, little board, the pins that bounce the marbles along, they're mm -hmm. the cause. They're the eutaxicological argument. So you've got the cause and you've got the purpose and the purpose isn't always revealed. Is this a divine purpose? No, it's just statistics. And you'll see, a lot of times you'll see people who are religious who are trying to sound more authoritative by being scientific and say, oh, look, this is revealed. There must be a divine purpose or a divine cause. The cosmic and the, anthrop uh, the anthropic principle doesn't, doesn't say that. The weak anthropic principle doesn't say that. There's a strong anthropic principle that puts God in there, but that's, that's another story for another day. Well, what's the connection? How do we connect mind? Well, Brandon Carter in 1974 realized that this idea links us, our mind as observers, to the size and shape of the entire cosmos. And the argument as Barrow and Tipler develop it, they say, look, <clears throat> when you go out at night, you get your lawn chair and your thermos of coffee. I'm going to watch me some Perseid meteors. You go get your binoculars. I'm going to see if I can see the nebula in Scorpio tonight. You go out and get your telescope and say, I'm going to look and take some pictures of Saturn. And you look up and you ponder and you say, oh, the universe is so grand and so amazing. And Carl Sagan's poem, I suppose, The Pale Blue Dot. And he says, oh, the earth is a tiny speck. And there it is lost in the vastness of space. And everything and everyone that's ever been has been born and died here. This is your a speck on a speck floating in insignificance. Tipler, Barrow and Brandon Carter say, uh-uh. Because you exist as a carbon-based observer, the universe has to be the size and the shape and the age it is. It could be no other way in order for us to be here looking up and wondering at the sky. Right. And you say, well, how does that work? Well, it's pretty simple. You think of the first generation of stars when the Big Bang happens. What do we get? We get some hydrogen. We get mostly hydrogen. We get helium. We get a very little bit of lithium. Why don't we get bigger atoms? The furnace is too hot. The temperature will destroy larger atoms than lithium. And well, how do we make the larger, like oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, carbon? How do we make those? Well, we need cooler furnaces with longer cooking times. We need stars. We need stars that will over five or six billion years will cook and form and then explode in a supernova and seed the cosmos with enough of these heavier atoms so that the next generation of stars can form planetary disks and terrestrial planets like this one, which means you had to have been cooking elements long enough to get things like silicon, magnesium, iron, aluminum, the stuff of which a crust of a terrestrial planet is made. And so if you think about how long does it take for life to evolve on a planet? Well, the journey of single cell life to us is four and a half to five billion years. So you figure, okay, it takes five or so billion years to just make the elements to make the planets for life to evolve upon. And then another four to five billion years 
for life to emerge and develop into intelligent forms that can look out. So when we look at the universe, the fact that we are here means that the universe must be at least 10 billion years old. The universe must be at least 10 billion years in extent in every direction. The universe must be as old as it is, as big as it is, and complex as it is in order just for the possibility of some intelligent carbon-based creature to be standing on a planet with optics made of glass and looking out and seeing the universe as itself. In fact, Barrow and Tipler put it out that, you know what? Okay, with telescopes, it's our mirrors and our lenses that image, that collect the light and image the universe. And it's our eyes at the eyepiece or our fancier sensors that the focal point that collect these images and this data. But in effect, all of these are extensions of us. Web is an extension of our human creativity, ingenuity, and expertise, as is Hubble, as is Palomar, as is the, the very nice 10-inch daub there on Scott's desk. This is an extension of us. We are how the universe observes itself. And the universe was blind and could not observe itself for at least the first 10 billion years of its history. And without carbon-based life forms like us, and even if it's not carbon-based life, even if you want to go completely Star Trek on us and say, oh, silicon-based life and all that sort of stuff, it still requires the 10 billion year history just to produce life. So we are the way the universe observes itself. And the shape of the universe, the extent of the universe, the constants of the universe are uniquely, precisely tuned in order to make this life possible. If you make the gravitational constant a little bigger, I mean, tiny hundred thousandths of a percent, more stars collapse into black holes, gravitation is stronger, stars burn hotter, they explode sooner, planets don't have time to develop before the supernova, boom, and they're gone. If you make the gravitational constant weaker, you don't have stars hot enough to make elements. The ratio of the mass of a proton to the mass of the electron. The ratio, 10 to the 40th, between gravitation and the electric force, the electromagnetic force. If these things are altered in the slightest way, life is not possible. And so this leads us to the philosophical idea. Was it a purpose created this way by a divine being? Or perhaps do universes, are they born and die? And every time it's like a slot machine and we reset the constant? Because if that's true, we've had however many trillions of universes born and die completely sterile because the constants weren't right. So whether it's by accident or by purpose, the universe is finely tuned to produce us, carbon-based observers, and not just us, us. I'm a full believer that there's life on other planets. There's too many. It would be too great a waste of space to be conscionable. So all, these, all this carbon-based life is probably there throughout the universe. I, only, I know intelligent life on my planet. But we look at this and we say, oh, in order for the universe to contemplate itself, it has to be at least this old and this big to produce mind, to be aware of things like this, the universe must be very precisely tuned. And again, accident, purpose, don't know. Uh, and in the fact, if we look at this crazy, uh, you guys have all seen this little pegboard demonstration, haven't you? Where the marbles run down and they form the bell curve. Is there a purpose in there? Is there a divinity in there? Is it an accident of statistics? Uh, beyond my purview. I'm afraid. But in fact, Carl Sagan's idea that we are the most infinitesimal of short-lived beings on an insignificant speck lost in the vastness and therefore insignificant is completely wrong. We are significant because we are the way the universe sees and understands itself. And it took 10 billion years of cooking 
with a very precise recipe in order to produce us as a representative of carbon-based life. And so there is a very intimate connection between mind and the cosmos. I really encourage you to do a little more exploring on this. I put three books in the chat, uh, Just Six Numbers by Martin Rees, which is definitely the most friendly, accessible to the public. Uh, the Constants of Nature by Barrow, which is quite accessible and quite nice. And if you're in for something meaty and read a few paragraphs and think about it for a day and then go back again, uh, Tipler and Barrow's Cosmic Anthropic or the Anthropic Cosmological Principle uh, is well worth your time. It's just a great history of science and astronomy and cosmology. And if you have uh, any inkling of making the great leap from astrophotographer to cosmologist, from astronomer to cosmologist, I encourage you to take that leap and uh, become another part of the cosmos contemplating itself. I will take those words into heart, Daniel. It sounds like something I may well consider as much as I look up into space and wonder what's going on there. Um, as, a, as a Catholic, I often balance the, um, you yes. know, what the Catholics say of God and, yes. you know, my own relationship with God. And then, then we step aside and say, now what's this stuff made of? And, right. you know, that when you're, when you're Catholic, but you love space and, ast and astronomy and cosmo and principles of cosmology interest you, you do separate sometimes. You don't go with just blind belief so much as you go, you go with a curiosity of how these structures are, are made, how they come. Um, I was looking at the bell curve and saying, it's the nature of things to, it seems to be the nature of things to shape themselves into a pyramid, a triangle. Um, it just seems to be a fundamental shape that comes out of, um, that just naturally comes out. And, we get uh, order out of chaos. Yeah. We do. And it's not, it's not easy to take that step across to cosmological wonder because uh, the way we're taught science is very much in the Newtonian tradition of there are causes to things, but not purposes. And that's one of the things that people struggle with, with Darwin's ideas of evolution. And certainly, um, having been raised Catholic myself, I know Galileo struggled with his faith. Copernicus did. Uh, Kepler was a Lutheran, but he certainly did. Mm. And uh, Newton... <laughs> He had very interesting religious ideas, but all of these great thinkers uh, struggled with their relationship with, with God and divinity and uh, what a religion asks of us versus what our intellect demands of us. And uh, it's, um, it's never easy. It's always a struggle, but the struggle is worthwhile. Uh, wherever you are on the scale from devout religious person to a uh, committed atheist. This struggle with the relationship between mind and cosmos is worth thinking about. It makes your whole experience as an astronomer so much richer and more meaningful. Uh, I go out and uh, some of my students think I'm absolutely nuts when I bring this stuff up. Aren't we supposed to be talking about astronomy and gravity and orbits and stuff? I'm like, well, let's, let's, uh, well, instead of narrowing the focus, let's let's broaden the broaden canvas the a little bit. Yeah, I'll give you an example. I have um, my wife's two friends are complete astrologers and they post online. Oh, goodness. You know what I tell them? They'll say things like the moon is in Capricorn or the moon right. is in something. And I'll tell them, you know, I use your posts to know where to aim my camera in order to take images because whether I, whether or not I think that it affects how people behave, you did say where the moon was and I can use that. So, you know, it, it's an example of taking, even taking astrology, you can use it for, you know, there, there is some concrete 
thing you can do with that. And so instead of just you know, unfriending and saying you guys are crazy, it's like, well, no, there's something I can pull out of that. And, and that's uh, what I think. The astrology important. has the extremes of both ends. They go completely utaxological and they say, oh, this is the cause of your life, whether it's good, bad, indifferent, how your love life's going. And they also, uh, they, they go very much, this is utaxological, but uh, they also, because they are mostly modern Western people who were taught science in the Newtonian way, uh, you can quickly say, well, is it the purpose of the stars to control me? And it's an interesting, it's an interesting garden path to lead them down and kind of say, oh, well, let's think about this. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard to do it without convincing them that, without making them convinced that you're mocking them or trying to, uh, you know, tear their their ideas yeah. apart. Well, but, it's, uh, as we know, astrology can be big enough business because there's plenty of followers oh who are looking yeah. for. Yeah, I, I, I've had I've had people say, Dan, you should do this. You you know the math. You could do the calculations. I'm like, oh, no, I don't want to. Use your powers for good and not for evil. Um, no, I couldn't. I couldn't do that. Uh, I am very much a scientist and an observer and an astronomer. Uh, I I couldn't even, for whatever amount of money, go and put up stuff yeah. on astrology. I couldn't, in good conscience, do it. No, that's yeah. It's um, the images that I started taking. I realized there, you know, we talk purpose. In some cases, I think purpose is okay when it comes to. I take an image and am I doing it to see how many people like the image? Oh, that's cool. It gave me a greater sense of purpose and joy in taking the image and then zooming into the image. Like tonight, zooming in and going, I didn't realize that in every Milky Way photo you see, you'll see some sort of representation of this window. And right. it's just, it's information like that that makes that part of each of these images come alive there's something there's something more to it than is this a pretty image and can i get five thousand likes on it because it's such a pretty image and you know can i you know is it glorifying me as a photographer because it's such a beautiful image or am i just simply repeating the beauty of the cosmos itself well and you want to talk cause and purpose the photons you collect have been on their way, literally, if you're photographing the Milky Way, anywhere up to 100,000 years. If you're photographing galaxies, millions of years. Uh, and those photons are the cause of the image that appears on your camera sensor. Agreed. But was it their purpose? When you look at Andromeda in a, in a big reflector and go, ooh, galaxy. Was that the purpose of those photons? The purpose was this purpose ordained two and a half million years ago when those photons left those myriad stars across that entire galaxy. Were they purposed? We can certainly say they are the cause of me seeing this galaxy or photographing this galaxy. Uh, and I often comment to my students, oh, you're looking at Saturn, you realize the light left there six and a half hours ago, and it's been on its way all that time. Saturn is not where we're seeing it now. It's moved on. And those photons have come all that way to go extinguish themselves in creating an image on your retina. And one of my students just burst into tears, and she said, that's horrible to think that that light has traveled all that way, and it just went sploot on my eye. I said, no, it's glorious. It's wonderful. How else do we get information about the world around us? How are we aware? And if you're aware that your awareness has a cost, then cherish it. Make sure that the cost is worthy because you've used it to make a gain. And it's something to contemplate when we're out in the dark and looking up and clicking the camera shutter, or just in a lawn chair with a pair of binoculars. It's this idea of cause and purpose, and the idea that the universe really is finely tuned 
to produce life. And that life seems to be, intelligent life is certainly contemplative. We know that people have looked up and have recorded the phases of the moon in carvings on bone and stone and clay tablets for something going on 100,000 years. And way before we get into Eastern culture, Western culture, you know, Mideast, Middle Eastern culture and the, the whole Newtonian religious debates, all of this, mm -hmm. we know as human beings, we are contemplative beings. We are a contemplative life form. I think that's pretty good evidence that we are the way the universe sees itself because we see and we observe and we're aware and we wonder. And it seems like we've been doing that almost as long as there has been speech, certainly far longer than there has been written language, far longer than we've had written language. We've made these drawings to pass on our knowledge. We look, we contemplate, we think, and we pass on what we discover. Uh, we are the instrument through which the universe observes, discovers, and becomes aware of itself. So a very intimate connection between mind and cosmos. Very well spoken. I think we should probably let Scott take back over or we'll go, we can, we'll find something else and go all night having this discussion. It's, it's the sort of discussion I think that we need more of. Well, um, it's, it's a great, it's a great discussion to have if you have like minds out in the dark with telescopes. Yeah. I, I have a picture to that end. I have a picture that I didn't show this time. And I think I showed it for astronomical league where I had the giant 24 inch telescope. I'll say giant, um, giant to me. next to the Milky Way, you know, both instruments there at the same time, um, as if to suggest there's a connection between the two. So that's um, I do. I feel the connection even more so than being able to explain it eloquently like you can, Dr. Barth. But, Thank you. Uh, it's it's that feeling of the connection that draws me out to take more images or if things aren't working to just shut the camera off, get the binoculars and let's see and how many looking. things I yes. can find, you know, yes. and yes. appreciate I, I the sky, especially in Michigan where clouds can come at any time and uh, change yeah. the uh, nature. And we, we need to remind people that every photograph implies a photographer, a, a purposeful mind that was behind this. And we tend to see images from Webb and Hubble and from you. And we go, wow, cool, the Milky Way, look. And we get lost in the image. And we tend to forget that behind the image, unseen is an imager. Someone, and I don't care whether you're Van Gogh doing this with paint. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm sorry, Starry Night looks like he was kind of on something when he did that. Brilliant, genius, right. crazy. Your images are glorious and the stuff from web i just i literally weep i'm like oh my god it's yeah. so beautiful yes but web is not web's photographs are not instrumental made by an instrument they're an extension of the minds of the people who built it yes the connection Absolutely. between the mind and the cosmos we need to remind people that it's there and i'm sorry this is one of the things where i completely disagree with carl sagan uh, and uh, I'm not going all divine and churchy. I'm just saying that, no, in fact, we have a real connection between mind and cosmos. Yeah, there's there's definite levels. And uh, Norm, you Sagan, made a, um, uh, another point, and they are processed ahead, by people. The images are processed by people. That's right. Yes. Yeah. yeah, and we shift our visible to the different wavelengths of infrared so that we can understand. And with, by doing that, it produces the image like that. And right. we understand what we're seeing when we look at those types of images. And um and it, you know, whether that was a calculated thing, we've we've done that for infrared for some time. We've shifted the color schemes for them, but it turns out the images are beautiful enough for those who may not know anything about astronomy, may not care about 
astronomy and astrophotography, but they're willing to look at those images and discuss them and talk about how beautiful they are. And I suppose that too, I mean, then it comes, it goes to outreach and that too is something, you know, even humans that aren't necessarily in cosmology will still contemplate the universe because images like that exist, they get created. So, you know, it, it expands the number of millions of people on earth contemplating the universe you know the universe yes. contemplates itself no matter almost what grade age or grade level a young child definitely seeing them look at the sun safely is uh it's a wonderful thing to see them oh i see it there you go that you've got a five-year-old just contemplated the universe starting with our nearest star it's a it's a wonderful thing it is well gentlemen thank you so much for a great evening uh i think we've left uh some of our audience here deep in thought they all want to uh, get around a campfire and talk about this some more so <laughs> we, <laughs> and so we did our we, job as we sit around the virtual campfire tonight uh i want to thank you all for tuning in to the 102nd Global Star Party. Uh, we will run the 103rd Global Star Party next Tuesday night. Um, so uh, tune in for that. Um, until that time, uh, we wanna thank you all for uh, also being a very important part of Global Star Party itself, for sharing our uh, programs, for supporting those programs. And um, uh, so we're gonna wish you a, a great night and uh, uh, which wish that you can keep looking up. So take care. And I think that's, that's it. Thanks everybody. Thank and you. I'm going to run, uh, don't run away. Okay. Cause I will run a, um, a little, uh, 10 minute feature, uh, that I think you might enjoy. When considering the possibility of life beyond Earth, we look for three main ingredients. The first one is key elements such as carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and sulfur. The second is a source of energy. And the third and perhaps most important is the existence of liquid water. Water is a necessary solvent in all chemical reactions that have to do with life. Energy is required to drive these chemical reactions and organic matter is the material from which all life that we know of is made. Life as we know it requires liquid water. Scientists believe that life on Earth started in our oceans. Now through our exploration of the solar system, we've realized that the moons around the giant planets have the right conditions that there could be liquid water underneath their surfaces. And so that really sort of expands our whole concept of where you could have a habitat, where we might find life. Water is fairly common in the universe. We've seen traces of water in large molecular clouds between stars. We've seen traces of water in protoplanetary disks. We've also seen traces of water as water vapor in the atmospheres of giant planets around other stars. And we know that water is in the atmospheres and interiors of our solar system's giant planets. So we know that water is ubiquitous throughout the universe. As far as liquid water, that's a little less common. Earth is the only planet in the solar system where we see liquid water at our surface. Moons such as Enceladus and Europa may have liquid water beneath layers of ice. We're really expanding our understanding of what makes a place habitable. Instead of just looking for an Earth-like terrestrial planet that's a very specific distance from its star, we're learning that there can be hidden habitats that are underneath icy layers and they can be a lot further out from the sun. So we believe icy moons in the solar system actually harbor kilometers thick oceans underneath their icy surfaces. These icy moons and their subsurface oceans may be some of the best places to search for life elsewhere in our solar system. Enceladus is one of Saturn's many moons, and it's a very small moon that people tend to kind of ignore because it's so small, about 500 kilometers in diameter. But decades ago, in the 1980s, from ground-based observing, we found out that the location of Enceladus relative to Saturn happened to coincide nicely with Saturn's E-ring. And so we were thinking that Enceladus had something to do with the E-ring particulates, the icy material, but we weren't sure. 
What we later find from Cassini was that we directly determined that there are indeed plumes jetting out of the south polar region from cracks in the south pole of Enceladus in the crust, and it's dominantly water-rich material just jetting out into space. And so the way we saw it, Cassini happened to be located where Enceladus was backlit from the sun. And so you saw this curtain of beautiful diffuse material jetting out of the south polar region. Quite breathtaking, actually. Even more, we were able to use the different complements of instruments on board Cassini to go after the chemical composition of the plumes. And that's where things got really interesting. So number one, that's because of liquid water. There's definitely a liquid water reservoir subsurface below the icy crust, but that is there. Number two, the chemical composition of the plumes told us that there's a lot of organics, things that make up amino acid and things on life that are very interesting. And number three, what we were really looking for is a source of energy. On Enceladus, photons from the sun aren't going to work because you can't penetrate the tens of kilometers of icy crust to get down to where the liquid water reservoir is. But what Enceladus does have is hydrothermal vents. It's very hot and filled liquid water that has a lot of analogies with the ocean floor where we have a form of releasing chemical energy via something called serpentinization. And so we think that Enceladus might have that potential to have an energy source being chemical, not sunlight. And so you put all that together and Enceladus has all the ingredients or most of what we need for life. That makes it a very astrobiologically interesting object to study. Europa is one of the largest moons of Jupiter, and we believe that Europa has a subsurface ocean tens to hundreds of kilometers thick. And so this ocean may be one of the best places to search for life in the solar system. There's been three space missions that have provided evidence for Europa harboring liquid water. The first one is Voyager in the late 70s. The second one is the Galileo mission in the late 90s. And most recently, Hubble, which detected plume-like uh, emission from hydrogen and oxygen, which is closely related to the existence of water beneath its surface. These plumes may be directly ejected through cracks in the surface of the moon. And therefore, what we're seeing in water vapor plumes is the actual ocean water from the subsurface of the moon. As these plume particles are ejected to space, solar radiation is going to excite these water particles, creating vibrational modes. Now, these vibrational modes are signatures that can be detected at infrared wavelengths by the Keck Observatory. So we observe Europa on 17 dates. What we found is that the majority of observations have no presence of water. However, on one of those dates, we detected water. We detected H2O. In the past, Hubble provided indirect measurements of water by detecting hydrogen and oxygen. But now we have directly detected water for the first time. Both the Webb Telescope and the Europa Clipper mission will give us a much more detailed picture of the surface of Europa, its cracks and crevices, detailed pictures of the water vapor, as well as other molecules that may also be emanating from the subsurface of Europa. So both of these missions will give us a great picture of whether Europa is truly habitable. Titan is a moon of Saturn. It's the second largest moon in the solar system, and it is about two times larger than Earth's moon, and actually bigger than the planet Mercury. And Titan is also interesting, it's the only moon in our solar system with an atmosphere. It's surrounded by sort of an envelope of gaseous nitrogen, just like our own Earth is. Titan was first discovered by telescope observation back in the mid-1600s. The first spacecraft observations were made of Titan during flybys through the outer solar system that was in the late 70s and in the 80s. But we really were able to explore Titan in depth with the Cassini-Huygens mission. The Huygens probe was dropped into the atmosphere of Titan and it made measurements of chemistry and it took images as it fell to the surface. And that was back in 2005. And since then, the Cassini orbiter made over 100 close flybys of Titan. Cassini, in its design with the different instruments, we purposely were picking instruments that could go into longer wavelengths into the infrared so we could really understand the moon. We were able to basically peel back the layers of Titan 
to really see what was below, and it was remarkable, very Earth-like. The landscape is similar to Earth's in many, many ways, but with a little bit of a twist. So on Titan, you can find dunes, you find lakes, there are river channels, the atmosphere is very dense and you can get clouds and smog and you even get rain. We saw winds, we saw seasons, and one really important thing we saw was liquids pooling in the polar regions on the surface, a lot of it. But because Titan is so cold, those features are all made of uh, very exotic materials compared to what we would find on Earth. So the lakes and the rain are made of liquid methane. The crust that forms the surface of Titan is actually water ice, but it's so cold that it's as hard as rock. And in the atmosphere, we get this organic chemistry that forms large organic molecules and particulates. They fall down to the surface and then behave like dust or like sand does. So it makes us want to go back to really understand the complex organic environment of that surface and what it means for either past life or maybe future life. Dragonfly is a mission that was just selected by NASA to fly to Titan and arrive in the mid-2030s. Dragonfly is going to make a whole bunch of measurements to help us understand the environment on Titan and its potential for habitability. We'll be taking measurements of the atmosphere. That includes things like pressure, temperature, winds. We'll probe the surface to try to understand what materials the surface is made out of. We'll also be drilling into the surface to look for the types of organic molecules that are present and to try to see if we can find any examples of compounds that mimic the types of building blocks we know we need for life on Earth. We don't really know how life started on Earth. We don't exactly know what the chemical environment of Earth was like before life started. So with Titan, we have this really unique opportunity. There are times in Titan's past where there could be liquid water on the surface. Impact craters can generate impact melt, and there's a potential for a possible cryovolcanism to erupt some liquid water onto the surface. And so we know that there's a rich organic chemistry going on in the atmosphere. We know that's depositing to the surface. If there were times where those organics and the liquid water environments were mixing, then there may be some really interesting chemistry taking place. When you have these processes operating for hundreds of millions of years, how far can they get you down that path of chemical complexity? And can we see reactions and molecules that start to look something like what we think of as essential elements for our biochemistry for life on Earth? In the future, looking forward as opposed to looking back and thinking about Titan as a chemical laboratory for the prebiotic Earth, I like to look forward thinking about what's going to happen when the sun evolves and warms up and the habitable zone actually moves out to where Titan is, and it will. You have all the organics, you're going to have a source of energy, all we have to do is melt the frozen water and we're going to have a pool of organics just embedded in liquid. Titan might actually have a chance at that point to harbor life. So when we think about ocean worlds, it's good to compare them to what we know about Earth. In total proportion, Earth is about 0.1% water. An ocean world is a body that has, in proportion, about 10 times more water than Earth does. And when we think of the Trappist planets, those planets have about 50 times more water in proportion to what Earth does. Ocean worlds do appear to be common in our galaxy. As far back as the early 2000s, we had astronomers, some of them still here at NASA Goddard, that suggested that we would have ocean worlds orbiting low mass stars. Recently, we've looked at about 52 exoplanets, and these are low mass exoplanets. And what we found is of these 52 planets, one out of every four may be an ocean planet. And when it comes to these ocean planets, over half of them may be ice covered ocean worlds. And so Enceladus and Europa may serve as small-scale analogs of these planets. So there are a number of different ways to search for life on planets around other stars, but the key uh, method is the study of the atmospheres. We can search for signs of life, biosignatures we call them, things like oxygen, water vapor, carbon dioxide, even more unusual biosignatures, things like chlorofluorocarbons or other things that are only produced by intelligent life. By looking for these key constituents of planetary atmospheres that signal life, we can discover life forms on other planets that we could never actually visit in our lifetime. So this is very analogous to how we study the atmospheres of moons and planets in our own solar system, and really makes the connection between studying the plumes of Europa and the atmospheres of planets around other stars.
What I would like to see is the definition of a habitable zone expanded. We don't want to keep thinking too narrowed about liquid on the surface, but broaden the scope and really try to embrace other worlds that might seem too far from the host star and frozen out when they really aren't frozen at all. At great depths, they harbor a warm, hydrothermal-driven liquid water environment. Well, good night, everyone. Uh, sleep well, and we'll be back next week. Uh, with more Global Star Party. Take care.